morning, everyone, and welcome to the first meeting of this committee in 2021. I would first of all like to welcome Stuart McMillan, who replaces Angela Constance on the committee. Congratulations to Ms Constance on her appointment as a minister, and I invite Stuart McMillan to declare any relevant interest. Uh, thank you, convener. I have no relevant interest to declare. Thank you, Mr McMillan. Uh, on to agenda item two, and that item of business is a decision to take agenda item five, a discussion on the committee's work programme in private. Can I ask members if they agree with that, please? Thank you very much. Agenda item five will be taken in private. We go on to agenda item three, and our main public business today is an evidence session on the complaints handling phase of our inquiry. And we will also seek to cover the judicial review with the permanent secretary. I do not intend to repeat all of my statements from the start of our meeting on 18 August, but I would remind all of those present and watching that we are bound by the terms of our remit and the relevant court orders, including the need to avoid contempt of court by identifying certain individuals through jigsaw identification. The committee as a whole has agreed that it is not our role to revisit events that were a focus of the trial that could be seen to constitute a rerun of the criminal trial. Our remit is to consider and report on the actions of the First Minister, Scottish Government officials and special advisers in dealing with complaints about Alex Salmond, former First Minister, considered under the Scottish Government's handling of harassment complaints involving current or former ministers and procedure and actions in relation to the Scottish Ministerial Code. The more we get into specifics of evidence, that is time, people, cases, the more we run the risk of identifying those who make complaints. The more we ask about specific matters covered in the trial, including events explored in the trial, the more we run the risk of rerunning that trial. In questions, reference to specific dates and individuals should be avoided. And questions should be phrased in general terms where possible to avoid the risk of jigsaw identification of complainants. In addition, please do not refer to civil servants by name unless absolutely necessary, and do not refer to civil servants by name below senior civil service level. I would also emphasise that the committee would be content to receive written supplementary points should any witness to this inquiry have concerns that their response may stray into this territory. Given the number of documents and complaints handling, for ease of reference, when asking a question, please mention the document number, footnote reference, and whether it is in batch one or two. Finally, can I highlight that the government has provided a paraphrased version of the 29th December 2018 report that provided advice to the Permanent Secretary on the Judicial Review. The Committee has seen the full report on a confidential basis, and the paraphrasing of informative confidential sections is more limited than the Committee had anticipated. I appreciate the Government continues to assert legal professional privilege, but I would encourage the Permanent Secretary to be as expansive as possible in her answers to aid scrutiny. And at this point, I would invite Alex Cole Hamilton to say a few words. Mr. Cole Hamilton. Thank you for bringing me in, Convener. Yes, there have now been two votes by the Scottish Parliament to insist that the Scottish Government le uh, waive legal privilege in this, in this instance. Um, and we are still involved in negotiation with the Scottish Government around the same. Um, part of that negotiation was to um, allow us to proceed with our concession, uh, was to open a reading room just before Christmas, where we would see um, a very helpful document, I think members would agree, from Sarah Davidson, which actually captured a lot of the legal advice and the, the sort of hinge points around decision making, um, on the agreement that we would then be able, at this meeting, to cross-examine the Permanent Secretary on the decision-making um, around that legal advice um, through this paraphrased document. Now, my understanding of the definition of to paraphrase is to uh, recast remarks or text in an abbreviated original form as an alternative to quoting, but really still conveying that original meaning. 
But what we've been given by the Scottish Government um, and on Friday, that was the first time any of us saw it, um, was not paraphrasing. It was a redactions and it was a statement of the government's legal provision uh, positions, which we have heard in many, many times before. It has undermined our ability to effectively question the Permanent Secretary. I think the government has behaved outrageously and with contempt to the Scottish Parliament, and we will visit this again in the Chamber if needs be. But we might as well be asking Leslie Evans what she received for Christmas, for, for all we will learn as a result of uh, the, the redacted and um, wholly unhelpful document we've been presented this morning. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Cole Hamilton. All noted. And uh, with that, can I welcome Leslie Evans, Permanent Secretary, of the Scottish Government? And I begin by inviting Ms. Evans to make the affirmation. I uh, can ask Ms. Evans to please raise her right hand and repeat after me: "I solemnly, sincerely, and truly declare and affirm." I solemnly, sincerely, and truly declare and affirm that I will tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. That I will tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Thank you very much, Ms Evans. And I now invite you to make an opening statement. Thank you, Convener. For the record, I shall be giving evidence to the Committee on behalf of Ministers and not in a personal capacity. In January 2018, the Scottish Government received two formal harassment complaints and applied a Government procedure which had been developed in line with legal and HR advice to investigate the issues raised. These, these complaints could not be ignored. Firstly, everyone has the right to a safe workplace free from harassment. The Scottish Government recognises this as both a legal and moral responsibility and part of its duty of care to all employees. Secondly, these were serious and specific allegations. In fact, three of the alleged incidents were considered sufficiently serious that, upon advice, it was deemed necessary to refer them to the police in case they constituted not only behaviour that was unacceptable in the workplace, but also criminal behaviour. Complaints were investigated internally over several months by an investigating officer following due government process and drawing on the statements of witnesses provided by both the complainants and Mr Salmond. The Scottish Government was in regular contact with Mr Salmond's lawyers from the 7th of March 2018, when, following completion of the investigating officer's initial report, he was, in line with the procedure, informed of the complaints. Mr Salmon's full, fair and reasonable participation was sought in line with government procedure, and as set out in evidence provided to the committee, he was fully represented throughout via his lawyers. Time scales were extended on three occasions to allow Mr Salmond additional time to respond to the complaints. Indeed, I specifically and personally instructed that the investigating officer's report should not be finalised until Mr Salmond had been given a further opportunity to present his position as fully as possible. The government procedure specifies the permanent secretary as the decision maker, responsible for determining if there is a re reasonable belief that a complaint is well founded. That involves considering each individual cause for concern, weighing up all evidence available, drawing on advice and extant legislation, and setting out the rationale in coming to a view, including which complaints to uphold and which not. I exercised this responsibility with care over several weeks, questioning and challenging the detail, comprehensiveness, appropriateness, quality and robustness of all evidence presented to me. In keeping with the government procedure, I did not inform the First Minister that an investigation was underway. However, I understand Mr Salmon did so. The First Minister did not make any attempt to influence the investigation at any point, nor did she receive a copy of the investigation or decision reports. I would very much like to provide greater detail on the evidence and rationale for my decisions set out in the decision report, but as you know, I am unable to share this due to a dispute with Mr Salmond about whether the report, now reduced by the court, can be shared. But what the Scottish Government can share, it has. 
We have followed through on the Deputy First Minister's commitment in his letter of the 26th of October to provide the committee with as much material as possible to aid its deliberations. To date, we have provided 598 documents, totalling around 1,900 pages and 19 hours of evidence by civil service witnesses. In addition, the Scottish Government has taken the unprecedented step of arranging confidential access for committee members to the summary of legal advice ahead of the decision to concede the judicial review on the single ground of a potential perception of bias. Convener, this may be my final appearance at this committee, and I'd like to close with three short fundamental points. Firstly, as several of you have served as ministers know, the civil service serves the government of the day, including implementing government procedures. The civil service code informs all civil service actions all times. It requires me as permanent secretary to act lawfully, taking and acting in accordance with professional advice at all times. And I can assure the committee I did just that. The Civil Service Code, along with legal advice, guided and informed every Scottish Government action under scrutiny by this committee in the development of the harassment procedure, in the investigation of these serious complaints, and in the decision-making that followed. And as the Lord Advocate has confirmed, the position of the Government at all stages of the subsequent judicial review was informed by legal advice. And prior to the decision to concede, based on assessments that the case could be properly defended. The Civil Service Code and its values of integrity, honesty, objectivity and impartiality are statutory. They're also integral to our professional behaviour and judgement. Having spent half of my public service career in the Civil Service, I hold these values dear, as I know do all civil servants. So whilst I welcome the committee's scrutiny and challenge, I robustly and resoundingly reject any attempt to misinterpret, misattribute or misconstrue the role or motives of civil servants who carried out their professional responsibilities in good faith and in order to improve the Scottish Government's workplace culture and importantly to respond to serious and specific complaints. Which takes me to my second point, because as Permanent Secretary, I'm also responsible for the leadership, operation and performance of the organisation. And that is why I have acknowledged and apologised on several occasions, rightly, for the procedural failing that came to light. And it's why I've committed to apply valuable learning across the Scottish Government, from the outcome of the judicial review, the forthcoming conclusions of the review led by Laura Dunlop QC, the findings of this very inquiry, and indeed from our own internal review of information management, to ensure that staff have confidence in our commitment and approach to tackling sexual harassment in the workplace. There is, of course, no room for complacency, but you will find evidence that the Scottish Government is making headway in this endeavour in the recent Public Service 2020 results, Public Survey 2020 results, where we've achieved strong improvement on leading and managing change, our highest ever score on inclusion and fair treatment, and the lowest ever proportion of colleagues responding that they had been bullied or harassed at work. Finally, convener, in my first appearance before this committee, I said that the Scottish Government did not choose the easy path, but it was and remains the right path. It was right to create the environment in which these complaints could come forward. It was right to challenge any culture of silence and tolerance and to provide channels to report harassment and ensure that victims felt heard and their concerns validated. It was right to take these complaints seriously and to investigate them fairly. It was right to defend our actions in doing so in court. Doing nothing was not an option. Indeed, convener, if that had been the decision, it would have been strongly and justifiably criticised. I still stand firmly by that position and shall continue to champion the Scottish Government's work to support staff well-being and to build an environment where employees not only expect 
that are empowered to demand a safe working place, free from harassment, from wherever that might come. Indeed, convener, I'm sure you would expect nothing less. Thank you uh, very much for that, Ms Evans. And uh, I'll now move on to questions by our committee members. Uh, I will get round all committee members, but could I ask uh, if any member wish to come back uh, with further questions, if they would just put an R in the chat box, please. And I'll first of all, uh, go to our deputy convener, Margaret Mitchell, and uh, Margaret Mitchell will be followed by Alistair Allen. Thank you, convener. Um, and can I thank the uh, permanent secretary for her opening comments? Uh, I merely comment that um, yes, there has been a by the the Scottish Government. Um, but can I note and register the committee situation at doing this, and that we're now at the point of receiving some of the handling of complaints um, information only on Friday last week and even more stuff today. That's pretty unacceptable, I would have thought. Um, permanent Secretary to the government, Scottish Government, its senior policy advisor to the First Minister and Secretary to the Cabinet. You are also the Principal Accountable Officer. For the responsible to the Scottish Parliament for the excess government responsibilities. So, can you confirm in the first instance, was there ever a public or parliamentary record of the procedure ever having been adopted? And if not, why not? Yes, Deputy Convener, I'm sorry, I'm not picking up all of your comments, but I think I've understood that question. It's just to register that I didn't hear absolutely every part of what you said. So forgive me if I have uh, missed out on some of those aspects. Certainly in terms of your uh, point about the adoption of the procedure, the procedure is, is an employment procedure, so it, it wouldn't go to the Parliament. Um, but there was a clear record of it having been signed off by the First Minister who had commissioned that through Cabinet. Okay, thank you. Can I move on to um, a question about whether under the procedure the decision to make a complaint public could be used as a form of retro reputational sanction for a former minister? Uh, I'm, I'm not sure about the premise of your question. You're asking about whether it was made public or whether the basis for it being made public. Whether that could be looked at, a decision to make a complaint public could be used as a form of reputational sanction for a former minister, because clearly, in this instance, then um, there was an interdict from the former first minister. Um, I am. I am. It wasn't fair. Can I uh, interrupt you, please? Didn't um, agree. Ms. Mitchell, I'm interrupting um, because your, your sound is very, very bad, and, and we aren't able to uh, make out everything that you're asking. Um, what we would like to do, with your permission, is turn your camera off, uh, and that may allow the sound to come through better. So we shall try that now. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Clearly, the first minister had. Um, originally put an interdict in, uh, because um, making complaints public was very damaging to um, his, uh, to any minister's uh, reputational um, standing. So could this, under the procedure, a decision to make a complaint public be viewed as a, a sanction for a former minister? So I think there's two issues here. I mean, firstly, the procedure does not have sanctions uh, against ministers, as, as you pointed out. The procedure is intended as an employment procedure, and one which is about um, providing a mechanism to address complaints and grievances, and that is its fundamental purpose. I think, on terms of this occasion, 
as you will know, there was a, um, an FOI request received in June regarding um, the uh, allegations against Alex Salmond. And that was the issue which, without going into the details of that, unless you require me to, that was the, uh, the issue which prompted uh, public understanding, not of the complaints, but of the allegations of the fact that there had been allegations made against Mr Salmon by employees of the Scottish Government. Can I ask then, would it be in your role um, absolutely paramount that if you thought there was um, something that was going to reflect very bad you, badly on the reputation of the Scottish Government, then you would um, seek to, to do something to um, mitigate that or to avoid that? Well, clearly, the reputation of the Scottish Government comes into my remit and responsibilities, but it doesn't overshadow or over um, uh, take precedence over the civil service code or uh, legislation such as freedom of information, uh, which we are bound by statute, um, or indeed by any other um, uh, legal requirements that we have in order um, to make information available to the public, of which there are many. So, um, although reputation, of course, is important, uh, the law, the Civil Service Code, and my uh, requirement to abound by both of those supersede any such uh, any such issue. Right. Well, can I ask about um, when the decision was made um, to uh, the complaints and that we should be referred to Alex Salmond? Then he offered arbitration. That was rejected by you. Um, can you explain how you weighed that up against what you were being informed by the First Minister? He thought the procedure was unlawful and explained why it was unlawful. You weighed that up with the potential danger to the reputation of the Scottish Government if it turned out, as it eventually did, that um, in pursuing this, they had acted or, or pursued it in a manner that was unreasonable. Again, not, not quite sure that I picked up all the points you've made, Deputy Convener, but certainly if, it, if we talk about arbitration in the first instance and then the, the concerns that Mr Salmon had about it being the procedure being unlawful or unfair, in terms of arbitration, the decision to, re to reject arbitration was taken after taking uh, legal advice, as I think you're aware. Um, it was regarded as both inappropriate um, and not the way to resolve public policy, but also it was not clear that it was going to be cheaper, quicker, or avoid court or a judicial review. We can go into more details about that, but I know we spoke about that at, at the previous time I was in front of the inquiry. In terms of um, Mr Salmon's concern about um, the uh, procedure being unlawful and or unfair. We responded to those concerns, as you know, from having seen the correspondence between ourselves and Mr Salmon's advisers. And indeed, these formed part of the original judicial review grounds to challenge the procedure and the investigation process. And each of these um, were set out, our response to these were set out in the open record provided to committee, but obviously provided to the court at the time. We defended the procedure and the investigation process on each of these grounds of challenge, including unlawful and unfair. Right. Can I perhaps refer you to the evidence that you quite correctly said um, you gave on the 17th of November, where this was addressed? And during that, you see arbitration was not provided for in the procedure, so that was the reason not to consider it. But surely it's the case it didn't have to be provided. Arbitration could still have been considered. You also state the Scottish Government could be accused of a cover-up. Um, but um, I think that must be weighed against um, the Scottish Government taking every reasonable step um, or deciding if this was in fact competent and uh, a legal kind of process and arbitration would certainly have resolved that and you also state and this I find very puzzling 
that it's not for the complainers to decide whether the procedure was right. Yet, there's in our evidence, 1st of December, on the development of procedure, said it was the permanent secretary's decision to consult Ms. C and others in the procedure. This was to give um, the experience. On one hand, you're, you're quite happy to uh, complainants, but on the second, you don't even give them the opportunity to consider arbitration. So I, I think we're confusing two, or maybe conflating two different aspects here. Um, one, in terms of um, the issue of arbitration, which I shall come back to, and the other in terms of where and whether it was right to offer the complainants the opportunity to know about the procedure before, uh, when they had made concerns, rather than before they, they before they turned into complaints. In terms of arbitration, I took advice on the uh, option of arbitration. It's not set out in the procedure, but that wasn't a reason not to consider it. I took very clear legal advice on the benefits or otherwise of arbitration, and I did not depart from that legal advice. You heard, I think, in um, detail about some of this advice which the Lord Advocate um, articulated in his session on the 17th of November, about particularly um, whether or not it was appropriate to resolve an issue of this kind by a confidential procedure. And I think to quote him also, he questioned whether a public law dispute of this sort could appropriately be submitted to arbitration, because it's commonly used for contractual disputes. But in addition to that, I think you heard from Paul Coquette, the former Director of Legal Services, about the legal position almost also being clear that it would not necessarily arbitration prove a better way, no necessarily be faster, nor cheaper, nor discreet. It doesn't necessarily lead to a, chicker, to, to a quicker resolution, um, and it doesn't necessarily mean that we wouldn't still end up in a judicial review. More to the point, from the point of view of the two complainants who you referred to, um, we still had a duty of care there, and it would still have required those complaints to have been investigated. So, Arbitration was pretty roundly and robustly, in terms of the legal advice I was uh, provided with, regarded as not a, a good solution. Turning to your point um, about the, um, the, those who had raised concerns and whether it was appropriate or not for them to be given the opportunity to comment or understand the, um, the uh, procedure, um, that is quite common, actually, for us for Scottish Government and other employers to share what the likely procedure is going to be for people who are indicating that they are likely to make a complaint. So that is not unusual. And I think you will know from other advice that was brought to this committee that, in fact, the procedure wasn't changed um, after uh, they had seen it. So it wasn't a fact that they were necessarily being consulted on it, but they were certainly given an opportunity to understand what would happen if they decided to raise a formal complaint, as opposed to having raised a concern, as had been the case at that point. If I could just comment on that, then clearly arbitration would have been a win-win situation. The Scottish Government, had it, um, had it been found that they are actually um, acting with apparent bias and in the process not giving the first minister an, an adequate time to do um, to or even um, proper um, opportunity to respond to, to the complaints. Um, so I, I find it really um, strange that as the accountable officer with the huge responsibility this opportunity. If the government was completely right in what, what it was doing, then it would have gone ahead with the judicial review. If it was wrong, lots of taxpayers' money would have been saved. But I want to, to follow particularly on the confidentiality and um, the involvement of the... Because we know that from the of information that we have been given, and that since specifically, um, that specifically on FN 43, there were numerous emails um, providing 
in detail of the consultation with Miss A and um, Miss B. And if I could just quote Miss A saying, and I think this um, is very significant, that a criminal process was never an outcome which she was actively seeking forward, what she hoped the procedure would gain for her. When I came forward about this, it was think so. It would mean that it would put on in place measures that would help prevent this happening um, again, and for the former First Minister to face some consequences um, for his actions through the party, as I know there is little the Scottish Government can do. But I have never been motivated by seeking a criminal case for this. And in fact, I think Ms. Richards said that it was your decision to reform it to the police and that themselves, the complainers, would never have done that. So can I ask you then what consideration then you gave of what was clearly uncomfortable, the complainers never wanting to go down the criminal route, never to be presented to the police? How the views of the complainers can be weighed up and were weighed up against the responsibilities of the employer in relation to a police referral here. All right, and I'm interrupting again at this point, uh, Ms. Mitchell. I think your sound's getting um, bad again, so I think we have to make this the last question and answer uh, from yourself. Then we'll move on to Alistair Allen. Ms. Evans. Thank you, convener. So, just just to be clear on the previous point that was being raised, I wouldn't want us to conflate the issue of arbitration with Mr. Salmon's concerns that he put forward and that we responded to at every stage about uh, the procedure. But I'll, I'll leave that one because I think we have given that quite quite a bit of time. I think your main point, if I could um, pick it up correctly, was about the referral of the case to Police Scotland, to, to the Crown Office, as it was, and whether or not this was um, against the wishes of the complainers. And it was against the wishes of the complainers. I, I understand that. The decision to, to refer the matter to the Crown Office was consistent with the procedure, and you'll have seen that in paragraph 19 of the procedure. But as I set out in my evidence on the 18th of August, and indeed I think again on the 8th of um, September, um, it was decided that we had to balance the legal advice, the legal advice that I was given to me as the person who was going to take this decision, um, and the careful consideration of the views of the complainers. And this was very carefully weighed up by me. I was particularly concerned and took some time to find out if we could possibly allay some of the complainers' concerns about a potential referral to the police. But of course, I had to also bear in mind the potential criminality and the advice I was being given on this about the potential criminality of these allegations. Now, I absolutely understood, and I can understand you're making this point completely and recognised the concerns and the anxieties by the complainants. And this is documented, as you have said. I understood that they were concerned about a loss of privacy, about media coverage, about how they might be required to revisit events that they would rather not. I know that they feared some backlash and criticism and retribution for some um, quarters uh, in, in public, but also from some individuals. So it was not something that I took lightly by any means. But you'll be aware in the procedure that it does say the Scottish Government may decide to refer a complaint to the police, even if the complainer does not want it. And as ACAS guidance also recognises it, if they do not want to tell the police, you should still encourage them to do so, but you may still need to report it, but should tell the person affected if you're going to do this. And that is what occurred. Okay. Uh, I thank you for that answer, and I understand that was my final question, uh, Convener. I merely comment thank you for this thank procedure. You. Uh, no one is likely to if you want to um, come in again later, we can, we can see if your connection is better, uh, if time allows. And um, we move on, please, Alistair Allen, and uh, after that, it'll be Alex Cole Hamilton. Thank you, Convener. Um, Permanent Secretary, you've 
indicated that you've uh, spoken to this committee on a number of occasions now. Um, but I want to return to this question of prior contact, and you did indicate that, or um, you indicated that the extent of prior contact between the investigating officer and the complainer was not known until December uh, 2018. Now, when the extent was known, you took action. Um, but can you clarify? Um, did you have any knowledge of prior contact before the investigating officer was appointed? So, of course, as you know, it's not my role to appoint the investigation officer. That's for the director of people. So I knew that there had been some contact, but I did not know the nature of that contact. Um, I did not know the detail of that contact. And that's quite right, of course, because being the deciding officer, I would not and should not know of that. So whilst I was aware that there had been some contact, I was not aware of it and, and not of, of the nature that was subsequently um, uh, brought to bear in some of the documents that were uh, presented. Though, of course, all of that was in keeping with the spirit and intent of the investigating officer role, as you know. Thank you. Do you have a, do you have a view, nonetheless, in, in hindsight about that appointment? Had you, had you known that Judith McKinnon had been in touch um, with the complainers before they made the formal complaints uh, and before she was officially appointed if an investigating officer, would you, looking back, have been comfortable that that appointment was made? Well, I think, as I said before, the contact, and I knew little of it, but the contact, which I subsequently know about, was entirely in keeping with the um, intention and with the spirit of paragraph 10 of the procedure. And indeed, you, you I know, and the committee have had pieces of evidence to demonstrate that. Uh, the, the intent was very clearly demonstrated in the evidence that James Hine gave, who was the author of the procedure. Um, paragraph 36 of our own written statement on the JR talks about what we defined as being prior involvement. And Nicola Richards, I think, in her evidence also gave, uh, the Director of People gave information about why uh, the individual was appropriate for the uh, investigating officer role. So in the spirit of intent, um, it was quite appropriate. However, we now know, of course, through the JR process, um, that it could be construed and could be interpreted differently. So were we to introduce um, the, um, the procedure again, it would need to be on a very different basis with a different allocation of roles, which separated that out much more clearly. But at the time, which is what you're asking me about, it was clear um, what the intent and the spirit of paragraph 10 was about, the role of the investigating officer, and how that was, should be um, uh, uh, employed and deployed. On the 1st of December, Judith McKinnon uh, commented on the, the complaints process and said that uh, we tried to keep the number of individuals who were involved limited. Now, I can completely understand some of the reasons why you would want to keep the number of individual, individuals uh, limited in any complaint of this nature, uh, given the subject matter of it. Um, however, would you, looking back, feel that there are certain dangers associated with small groups of people? Um, and do you think that the group of people that was involved in uh, looking at this matter had a wide enough range of experience um, to deal with the legal and other issues involved? So I think this is a, an important point. Clearly, the procedure defines roles. Um, very precisely. Uh, so it doesn't allow for a dispersal of roles or a dispersal of responsibilities uh, across a wide range of people. It's very specific about the roles and functions that must be undertaken. And that uh, was and was, was rightly respected. However, uh, and indeed that those individuals were professionally qualified and professionally appropriately placed in those roles. However, we know uh, and you're aware that we have asked Laura Dunlop QC to look further at the procedure and particularly at how certain aspects of it might be implemented in the future. Um, one of the areas that I think is of import in this respect is the role of the permanent secretary as deciding officer. And that I'm sure will be part of what uh, Laura Dunlop will wish to look at. So we will be very open to recommendations of that um, review and taking on board if it is suggested that there should be a different distribution of roles, um, a dis different distribution of responsibilities in the future application of the procedure. 
Well, re related to that point, and looking to the, the future, um, you've uh, you've said just now, and you've said in the past that uh, Laura Dunlop QC would be looking and will be looking at the, the role of the permanent secretary as deciding what as you've just described uh, and how that will operate in the future. Um, if there were another complaint in the future, would you be comfortable with the permanent secretary playing that role, given some of the issues that we've we've seen and some of the issues uh, that Nicole Richards described to the committee on the first of December? I wasn't aware that uh, Nicola Richards had said anything about the role of deciding officer in her evidence. Uh, well, I have what, to say, what she what she said, if I should. Clarify on that was that she described yeah. um, uh, the permanent secretary's role as follows. Obviously, for the permanent secretary, everything eventually flows in that direction. So I suppose what I'm alluding to there is, are, are you, would you take a view about whether that should be the the direction of, of flow for all these matters in the future? Um, you know, do, do you do you feel that if if a complaint like this were to happen in in the future, that that shouldn't be the case? Uh, well, as you say, I will be interested to know what Ms Dunlop makes of this. Um, unfortunately, all things do come to the door of the Permanent Secretary eventually, not just on this, but on, on all matters. That is part of being at the head of an organisation and being um, accountable officer. So I think it will be difficult for, be, for my role to be completely dis disentangled. However, one thing I would say is that um, I have uh, created another Director General responsibility, set of responsibilities which were partially um, occupied by Sarah Davison, uh, whose handiwork you have been reading about, um, and now has been consolidated as somebody who is responsible for um, issues of personnel, issues of um, in-year finance, uh, information handling, and all the delicacy around sensitive information handling. So there is already a shift in some of the way in which we deal with some aspects of um, the supporting infrastructure of events of this kind, if you like, and we would want to make sure that that was taken into account by Ms Dunlop in thinking about future roles and responsibilities. But I would never wish to step aside from or assume my responsibility as head of the organisation, and when tough decisions have to be taken, then it's my role to take them. Thank you, Kimbina. Uh, Alec, Paul Hamilton, please, and then Myrtle Fraser. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, good morning, Permanent Secretary. Thanks very much for coming back to see us today. I very much hope this isn't your last session with us, because I hope that the will of Parliament will be finally satisfied and we will be able to see the legal advice uh, without um, legal privilege and ask you questions on the same. Um, as it is, I'll try to make the best of what we've got. Um, so I'd like to ask a couple of questions about complaints handling and then more substantive ones about the judicial review process. Can I ask when you first made Mr. Salmond aware of um, the complaints against him, or when, when the organisation first made Mr. Salmond aware of the complaints against him, what information about the complaints was shared with Mr. Salmond at the time? So when we first uh, came to Mr. Salmond uh, about the um, concerns that had been raised and the allegations, that would have been in March. And there was information set out at that point about the allegations and about the procedure that we would then follow to investigate those um, allegations. And Mr. Salmon was given an opportunity to, and indeed he engaged with the opportunity to provide information, witness statements, um, have access to information on diary uh, entries and so on, and all the information that he may wish to, to present his case. So um, I'd just like to bottom out what you meant by um, the information around the allegations was shared with Ms. Was it the exact um, uh, substantive complaint from the two women at the heart of this? Were, were, were they passed to him at that time? I would need to confirm the exact wording of that. But clearly, once the investigating officer's report had been complete, which was in early March, that was then uh, communicated to Mr. Salmond. Okay, so um, he had, it's fair to say that by early March, he had full sight of uh, the verbatim account of the allegations he was facing from the complaints. He was given information about those um, complaints. That, 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 those two things are very different, um, Secretary, if I may. Um, verbatim accounts is the uh, blow by blow. Uh, set of allegations that came uh, from the woman at the heart of this, 
Um, and information about those complaints is something I think very different. We, we already know that government is not very good at paraphrasing documents. Um, did, is that what happened here? Well, the process was followed and, and that was undertaken was in line with the procedure and good HR practice. Now, as you will be aware, in highly sensitive cases, of which this was one, we need to protect as far as we can the confidentiality of the complainers and the witnesses, but also ensure, as you're making the point, that the subject of the complaint has sufficient information to reasonably respond and to manage the risk of potential legal challenge. So the advice that was taken to this effect followed both of these. What we were able to share, we knew, for example, that it was likely that Mr. Salmon might know the individual's identity, and we need to ensure that there was sufficient specificity to allow for events to be clearly understood. But we also had a responsibility to protect the um, uh, and appropriately the sensitive issue of identification of individuals. So there was a balancing act to be taken on, on this, but it was drawing on good HR practice and on um, appropriate legal advice about how the procedure had been developed to address this and therefore what it, how it informed the information that was to be shared. So just to be clear, that information that was shared with, with Mr. Salmond about the substance of the complaints had been underpinned by legal advice that you'd received um, and uh, was, in, to your mind, uh, insulated against further legal challenge because it strikes me that if you parse uh, the substance of a complaint, then subsequently further down the line, uh, somebody who was the subject of that complaint uh, might have grounds to challenge that based on the fact that it was not the full account of, of the complaints being levelled against them. So my point was that the procedure which we were following to the, to the letter was indeed informed, as you know, by legal advice all the way along in terms of its development and also by HR practice. And it was good HR practice that we were following in how we conducted the investigation and how the investigating officer undertook her task, including sharing of information. So the procedure was underpinned by legal advice, but the application of the procedure wasn't. That's what you're saying? No, I'm saying the procedure was developed in line with HR and legal advice and that the investigating officer and myself and others who were involved in important roles in applying the procedure took uh, legal advice at every stage and did not depart from that composite legal advice either. Okay, thank you. I'll move on. Um, can I ask um, who you sought advice from on ascertaining the potential criminality of the complaint? So, in my, um, I, I wonder if you're talking, thinking about my decision report, or in terms of the uh, decision to refer to the Crown Office, or perhaps both. Both, both, really. Okay. Okay. So, I, I took and sought legal advice at every stage, both um, in terms of my responsibilities as a, as the deciding officer, but certainly at key particular points, such as the decision, as I referred to earlier on, to the Deputy Convener about referral to the Crown Office. That advice was complete and thorough, and from a variety of sources, as you'll be aware, and I did not depart from that composite advice at any point. I am not able to share with you, for reasons that I outlined in my um, initial remarks, the decision report. But I am able to tell you what that procedure, what that process comprised without any content or any other aspects. And if that is helpful, I will certainly go through that because that would give you also the um, indication of what other um, uh, sources of information and legislation I drew on in undertaking the role of deciding officer. Well, please do, yeah. Okay, so I think the important thing to do here is that there were three elements that I needed to take into account. The first was to approach this, and I think it's really important to emphasize this. This was a really important role um, for all sorts of reasons that I, I don't need to go into, but I was determined to exercise this considerable responsibility with real care. And so I was determined to spend time as was required to pay attention to detail, particularly to challenge the comprehensiveness, the robustness, the quality, um, and the appropriateness of the evidence that was being presented to me. And that included the full text of witness statements, both on the side of the complainers 
and on the side, quite rightly, of Mr. Salmon. So that was the first thing, an open mind and a, a critiquing and challenging approach. Secondly, I had to decide whether or not each complaint was well-founded or not. So this wasn't a carte blanche, all in or all out. Each of the complaints had to be analysed separately and individually. And I had to weigh up whether or not um, on the balance of probabilities and based on the evidence available that these were upheld, whether I should uphold them or not on an individual basis is really important for me to emphasise that. And thirdly and finally, I had to decide whether each alleged conduct amounted to um, harassment. And I had to weigh up in that process legal advice, but also extant legislation, which includes the Protection from Harassment Act in 1997 and also the Equality Act 2010. For example, that asks the question if conduct of a sexual nature had the purpose or effect of violating the complainer's dignity or creating an intimidating, hostile, degrading, humiliating or offensive environment. It also demands to consider whether the conduct in itself, which may not have constituted harassment, but when taken with other instances and other incidents, demonstrates a course of conduct which a reasonable person would consider amounts to harassment. So in addition to drawing on those legal definitions, I needed to look at the context of the complaints, the working environment and the nature of the professional relationship, as you would expect. I need to take into account the impact on the individuals, very importantly. And I needed to ask myself if I was satisfied that an event had occurred based on the evidence available. And if so, did it take place in the manner described? And importantly, was it corroborated by other witness statements? And of course, all of this is underpinned, as I mentioned in my opening remarks, by my responsibility as a civil servant and civil service code. So it was a demanding role, one I took incredibly seriously, approached with an open mind, with a complete clarity about individual concerns being upheld or not, very importantly, and taking guidance and drawing on sources of uh, legal frameworks, as well as taking into account the circumstances and the impact and the corroboration of evidence. Very important role, one that I have not undertaken uh, before of that nature in my professional career. Oh, I'm very grateful for that. That's very helpful. Can I just ask, um, going back to my original question, which uh, then led into that, um, did you speak to Police Scotland at any point um, informally uh, to seek their advice as to whether uh, to assess the criminality of the, the, um, the allegations? Yeah. Okay. That's very helpful. Um, I'll move on to the judicial review now, if I may, convener. Um, can I just ask, um, in terms of general questions about the um, the government's approach to legal action, um, is it normal practice, would you say, for the government to proceed with a defence of a judicial review um, if external counsel says that whilst the case is statable, it's more likely that the government will lose than win that review? At every stage, we need to be clear, and, and the advice that I drew on needed to be able to um, reassure me that the case was statable. And uh, the variety advice sources, which includes, of course, legal um, colleagues in the government, Lord Advocate, but also um, the uh, council advice, is part of the composite advice that I'm drawing on. So at any stage, prospects of success are constantly kept under review. And I think the Lord Advocate emphasised this in his information and evidence to you on the 17th of November. At every stage, I was weighing up not just legal advice, but also I was taking into account public policy considerations and my role as principal uh, um, accountable officer as well. So at every stage, we were making sure that we were clear about why we would proceed, what the um, risks and opportunities were in proceeding, and that that was kept under regular review. Yes. So in future then, in a theoretical judicial review, um, that you might have a, a, a situation where the external counsel told you the case was, um, was statable but likely to lose, and the government on, on a range of assessments might still decide to proceed. Is that correct? 
Well, I think we need to take this into a slightly broader context. Um, and again, I think the Lord Advocate described this very eloquently, as he would, of course, in his previous advice to you. I think he said at the time that legal advice is not a single thing at a single point at any one time, as you will know. Different lawyers have different views. Indeed, the same lawyer might take a different view as consideration of the case develops, and at any one time there is more information and more analysis coming to the fore. So at any one time, one has to take composite advice um, on what the legal stability and the legal circumstances and views are. And that will continue to be the case in a judicial review or indeed in any other circumstance where legal advice is being played. Okay, thank you. Um, just a couple more questions, Convener. Um, so we, we've learned a lot as members of this committee about duty of candor um, in legal proceedings. That is that um, each side has a duty to produce all evidence that is asked of it. Um, can I ask, was uh, the du that duty of candor explained to the key personnel um, involved in the preparation of the defence of the judicial review, namely the people who had been involved in the handling of complaints? And if so, why did the Scottish Government keep finding new seams of evidence to present to the court? So, I mean, this has been a point of considerable, considerable discussion during this inquiry, and one that I have thought about very carefully. I think we're very clear that there was a corporate failure for us to be able to get the right kind of information at the right time. Um, and that is something which I have taken to heart. And as you know, I wrote to you in November about the fact that we are now looking at an information that is live now, uh, a review of the, our information handling and the way we would truly deploy information. I just make two points on this. The first is that information handling, um, particularly in difficult and sensitive circumstances of this kind, but in any circumstance, for a public authority, particularly the size of the Scottish Government. I'm not making excuses here. I am just stating fact. It is incredibly challenging, particularly in the digital world, and we need to get better at it. I mean, there's something like 35 million documents in the um, Scottish Government's electronic document management account at any one time. There's 3,000 in my own email account roughly at any one time. We get something like nearly 3 million emails a week coming through the Scottish Government doors, as it were. So it is always challenging. However, the, the specs that we were provided, the specifications that we provided as part of the judicial review, um, those which were issued as response to um, consideration of particular elements of our case during the period of October and November, and then the Commission itself, which was a much more demanding and, and specified a, a bigger call on our, our requirements, those were challenging to respond to, there's no doubt about that. Um, that's why, as I said, I've put um, uh, a review in place to make sure that we get better at it. And we already have, though we may contest this, but we already have now a specialised team that is responsible for ensuring that we provide information of the right kind that is filtered through our responsibilities for data protection and for court procedures um, and, and uh, court restrictions but that we have a team that works solely on that responsibility in providing information to this inquiry. And we will probably need to retain that team in some small, uh, smaller version for the future, because this is how public authorities uh, need to, to be able to respond with their responsibilities in terms of information and open government commitments. I, thank you for that. I, I mean, I understand entirely what you say about the mega hall of data that an organisation as big as the civil service possesses. But with respect, this is not some uh, constituent grumbling about hospital waiting times. This is the, the evidence that was produced um, incrementally in, in the latter days of December in 2018 um, would ultimately be the smoking gun on which the failure of the judicial review collapsed. And, and it just feels that you understand that the optics of that look pretty bad. The, the, uh, and in a, in a way, you know, a reasonable person, as you've described previously, might look at that and say that actually the government had something to hide or was trying to hide that. I can see why that might be construed, and indeed I believe that is what has been, um, has been alleged in some circumstances. That is not the case. It, it really is not the case. And I absolutely take your point that um, the, the sharing and the, the speedy and effective sharing of information in any circumstance is important, nothing more so than in this one. 
And indeed, you will have seen from your uh, reading of Sarah Davis' report the speed at which I took a decision and asked for a commission to advise me on that com commission very rapidly after that information came to light. As we know, uh, there was nothing new in that information, in fact, about the way in which the investigating officer had played her role. It was entirely in, in, in keeping with the interpretation of, of the procedure. But it was the timing of that information coming out which led, as you know, to, uh, to my decision to concede based on the fact that it had um, some of the commitments that had been made earlier on by our legal representatives and cast doubt on our capacity to be able to, to show other evidence um, in, in our case at the right time. So I do not in any way um, uh, um, try and reduce down or, or somehow, uh, somehow uh, uh, give less um, import than should be to the information sharing processes which the government was was challenged by in those circumstances. But I would, in, in defence, say they were particularly challenging circumstances, material from a year old, uh, very broad, but also in context, information that would be very hard to make uh, and understand in terms of what exactly was required, because it was thematic. It wasn't asking for a document. It was asking for any information of any kind. And as you know, and it'll be my final point on this, because I'm sure others will want to come in, this wasn't something that could be done on a formulaic approach. It had to be done by individuals for their own accounts. I myself had to, as a haver, as is known in the legal term, as you know very well, and the owner of that information, I was the only person who could, who could look at that, who could filter through it, um, and to decide what was appropriate and what wasn't at that time, and what was available uh, to be able to, to be shared at that time. So I'm not trying to def defend that um, completely. I'm just trying to explain the circumstances of how that could have come into being. Okay, and my very final, very quick question, this is, it doesn't require a long answer at all, but this committee has established from a range of sources that external counsel to the government threatened to resign um, when that information came to light, um, was it, unless the government collapsed the case. Was that the hinge point? Was that the reason that the Scottish government decided to concede the judicial review? My decision was taken on a sifting of all the information at that point. And as I think I've already mentioned, it was based on uh, legal advice, certainly, but also public policy advice. And very importantly, my role as principal accountable yeah. officer that was the basis on which I took the decision to concede. Thank you, Kavina. Um, that's fine for me. Thank you, Mr. Cole Hamilton. Uh, Marjorie Fraser, please, and then Maureen Wood. Thank, thank you, Kavina. Uh, good morning, uh, Mr. Secretary. I've been having one or two technical issues at my end this morning. I hope you're able to hear me. Um, I really want to ask some questions around the issue of anonymity of the uh, complainants and confidentiality of the prospects, which were touched on by, by Alex Mohamedou a moment ago in his early questions. We decided early on that the uh, the complaints process would be anonymous, but we know from concerns that were raised by Mr. lawyers that they were concerned that this meant the, their client could not properly respond to them. Uh, because the, there was a lack of investigation uh, in terms of the complaints that, that uh, were made. I, I wonder how you think the, the former First Minister, or indeed any former minister, could properly respond which were made if the uh, identity of the complaint was not made available to them. So I, I apologise, Mr. Fraser. I'm not sure that I caught all of your question, um, but I think you were asking about um, anonymity and an anonymity of the complaints. Is that that correct? I'm not sure if somebody else heard it more. That's um, my understanding. Yes. Okay. So um, I think the the point is that this was an, this is a, a procedure that was introduced by the Scottish government in order that people with concerns and of their past experience and current experience could um, raise them as uh, uh, part of the context of working for the government. So this was an employment and is remains an employment and an HR policy. 
And from that point of view, and as mentioned earlier on, it was always developed with legal advice taken uh, into account and reflected upon. But it was always and remains an HR policy, which will continue also to reflect on the needs and the requirements of the, of the complainants. So there will always need to be a balance, and I think I mentioned this in my response to the Deputy Convener, there will always need to be a balance um, between ensuring that the complainer's confidentiality is um, protected, but there is also sufficient understanding and, and um, information to allow specificity on what is being um, uh, alleged. And that is a difficult balance to achieve. <laughs> one that was very much to the to the forefront in terms of the uh, investigating officers' uh, responsibilities and of the information that was shared. I think the, the second thing I would just want to say on this is that we were at pains to ensure that Mr. Salmon had every opportunity to engage with the procedure. And you will have seen much of this from the correspondence that has been shared with you. Um, Mr. Salmon was offered to meet with the investigating officer, though I think he declined that. Um, I delayed and extended the procedure on three separate occasions to ensure that Mr. Salmond had ample opportunity to produce information, witnesses, um, contacts for witnesses and witness accounts that he felt he would want to bring to have as part of the um, information that I would be drawing on in a deciding report. Uh, the first two of these were in the early stages, but as I said in my opening comments, I actually personally intervened um, and asked for um, the opportunity for his um, uh, to, to him to be asked to engage further because I was concerned that he was not engaging on certain complaints. So there is always going to be a balance between protecting confidentiality and ensuring that the person against allegations are being made has the information and the time to engage and the opportunity to engage appropriately with the procedure. And we adhere to the procedure on, at, every, at every stage on that basis. Uh, okay, thank, thank you for the staff. That's a very helpful uh, and comprehensive um, and me. Can I then follow up by asking um, a question in relation to the submission that the former Minister made to James Hamilton, a submission provided to this committee and is now, uh, as you know, in the public domain. And in that, uh, he uh, states that the First Minister's Chief of Staff, Liz Lloyd, named one of the complainants to Jeff Aberdeen, who was formerly Chief of Staff to the former First Minister. Is that something you have any knowledge of? Uh, can, I, I'm going to interrupt here. Uh, excuse me, Ms. Evans. Uh, I'm going to interrupt you. First of all, Mr. Fraser, it was really difficult to make out what you were saying. I believe I got the gist of it, um, which was about the recent uh, submission that's been in the public domain. Can I just point out to everyone here um, that that uh, statement, that information, has not yet been processed by Parliament to ensure it is compliant with legal obligations. So please have some caution in uh, making any reference to it. I know it is in the public domain, uh, but there is still a responsibility on this Parliament to abide by the terms of the order. Uh, so. While the public domain issue impacts on that, uh, we still need to evaluate the information that we choose to accept and publish in our own right. Uh, so I'm going to go back to you, Mr. Fraser, if you could um, perhaps be a bit more circumspect um, in how you put your issues. And we're trying um, very, very hard to be able to make out everything you're saying. You appear to have some connection problems at your end. Mr. Fraser. Thank you. I think I did see the Permanent Secretary indicate that there is a job, but perhaps I could follow up by asking, is there any reason a special advisor, a political appointment, would be aware of the name of complainants? I can't, uh, as I said, I can't comment on on allegations. As the convener says, from from other pieces of documents, I, I have not um, 
had an opportunity to, to see in detail or comment on appropriately. But um, I wouldn't expect, we, we did everything we possibly could um, to the point, I think, where actually we've occasionally, by your committee, been, been slightly criticised, but we've done everything we possibly could within the confines of the procedure to maintain confidentiality, to avoid any identification by any individuals. Um, and that was a really high priority for me, not just in terms of duty of care, but in terms of the, um, the ethos and the intent behind the procedure. Okay, thank you. I'm not sure that was an answer to the specific question I just asked, which is, why would a special advisor have access to the names of complainants? I think you'd need to ask the special advisor if that were the case. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Can, I, can, I draw your attention to, yeah, can I draw your attention to a document we've seen, which is number um, I B three one five, which is a memo from Nicola Richards, dated the third of November twenty eighteen, reference to the need for consultation with individuals before disclosing to another party or the police any information because of the risk of the mass press and individuals being identified. Um, and that was the approach that was. Uh, adopted by the Scottish Government. Uh, Mr. That was really difficult again, Ms. Evans. Did you manage to pick up the gist of that? Oh, I wasn't sure if this was to do with um, individual people raising, uh, talking to other complainants. I wasn't sure if it was to do with that. I'm sorry, I couldn't catch the yeah. the, full, the question. Was was that the Mr. Fraser? Yes, I, I was quoting from a document, we, which was a memo from Nicola Richards, dated the 3rd of November 2018, which was making yeah. reference for the need for the Scottish Government to consult with individuals before disclosing to another party or the police because of the risk of them being in the press and the individuals being identified. I was asking whether that was an approach that had been adopted Again, I didn't get to all of that. Um, I think it was to do with a, a referral to the police. Um, but if it was, the procedure is very clear. No, no, no. Uh, sorry, and um, Mr. Fraser, it's it's getting more difficult. Can, can I suggest that um, if if it suits you, uh, I'll move on to the next person. But perhaps you could um, use the chat box function here for your question. Um, and if you're not able to ask it again when we bring you back in, if you wish it to be put to the witness, we can do that. But we will come back to you. Uh, meanwhile, can I have Maureen Watt, please? Uh, thank you, Convener, and I hope you can hear me, uh, Convener and um, Ms Evans. Um, you mentioned paragraph 19 of the procedure. Um, about your duty of care as an employer. So, can I ask, does either your duty of care as an employer or the procedure itself actually require you to take complaints to the police if they contain something that you believe would be criminal? The uh, also probably to combine two questions. Um, and do you feel obliged to take the matter to the police? whether or not the complainer has consented to you doing so in all circumstances. So I think I mentioned in my comment earlier on that the, the, and my response to the question earlier on about the decision to refer to the police that there is um, the procedure does say in paragraph 19 that um, complainers should be informed and I felt it very important that they should be consulted and we should take careful consideration into account of the views of the complainers. But equally, if the alleged conduct could have amounted to potential criminality, it would be very important for me. In fact, it would be reneging on my duty as permanent secretary, but also as a civil servant, not to have referred 
uh, these um, allegations. If they are potential criminality, it would have been reneging on my responsibility not to have referred them. However, the point also needs to be made that I took legal advice on this, as I did and have emphasised throughout every element of, of this procedure. I did not depart from legal advice. So whilst I was, as I think I said earlier on, very cognizant and very empathetic to the views that I had heard from the complainers, their concerns about uh, being exposed, about media exposure, and about potential retribution and uh, commentary and potential criticism, I was very cognizant of that. Um, I still felt, having taken advice, that uh, I had to be cognizant of the potential criminality here. So it was not an easy decision. It was one I weighed up very carefully, and it was in keeping with the procedure. Of course, the final point of this, it would have been quite possible for the complainants to have gone to the police themselves earlier, but they chose not to. And I think some of the quotes uh, that the uh, deputy convener produced from information that's been shared with you illustrated why that was the case, and I absolutely understood that. So, um, so what I think it, that you're saying is, so it would be having taken advice from the police and others, it would be your decision alone on whether or not and should be taken to the police. And can I ask if so? If so, would you be doing that in your role as the deciding officer? under this procedure, or would you be doing it under your general role as head of the civil service? So, first of all, could I could correct you, I didn't take any advice from the police. I didn't have contact with the police. I took legal advice, as you would expect. Okay. And yet, my responsibility was twofold. One, as a deciding officer in a role which is laid out very clearly, and a procedure which is laid out very clearly. And it's, a, it's a government procedure, so one that I am obliged to comply with. But secondly, in terms of my duty of care and as permanent secretary, I would be concerned if there were potential allegate if there were allegations that could be potentially criminal. That those, uh, by not declaring those, I think I could be justifiably criticised. So legal advice was very carefully taken and adhered to, and I also had a responsibility not just as a deciding officer, but also as permanent secretary to ensure, as a civil servant but not least that the organisation is cognisant of any potential criminality. And I'm sure you wouldn't expect anything less. No, and in the same vein, did you feel that, it, that either your general duty of care as an employer or the procedure required you to reject the possibility of mediation without consulting complainers? Well, if I could perhaps just elaborate on the proceed on what took place around that point of of mediation, and again, I think we've we've talked about this at these sessions before. But just to be absolutely clear, I initially turned down the request um, on behalf made on behalf of Mr. Salmond um, of mediation because at that stage, and I think that was in the mid twenties of of April, something like the twenty third of April. The procedure and the process was still at a very early stage. It was still at fact finding, so it would have been inappropriate and unhelpful, I think, to have considered mediation at that point. And so I refused it on that basis. As you know, they came back very quickly again and asked further if mediation couldn't be um, an, an option. And it was at that point that it was agreed that we would put that to the complainants, having made it clear that it was too early. We asked the complainants, and I think this was um, the investigating officer, who, uh, Judith, who shared this information with you at her last session before you, if they were prepared to engage at any stage. So not that it was just too early now, but at any stage in the future, would they be prepared to engage with mediation? And they came back very firmly to say no. Now, Having said that, it was very clear to me, and it's very clear, I think, in, in anybody who has been involved in these kinds of matters in the future, mediation is a voluntary process which requires both parties to voluntarily participate. And it was very clear that we could only proceed with the agreement of the complainers, and that wasn't forthcoming. And my final point on this about the appropriateness of mediation, which again, I think I've made before, but I think it's an important one to emphasize, Dame Laura Cox, in her report on the House of Commons staff bullying and harassment, 
said, and I, if I may quote, it is generally very difficult to use mediation in any case of sexual harassment or in cases involving more serious bullying or harassment. And that is also upheld by our own uh, fairness at work procedure, um, an extract of which says mediation may not be appropriate if there is a significant power imbalance between the parties which cannot be bridged. It also lists out another range of reasons why mediation might not be appropriate. So to summarise, it was too early at the time, but when we did ask, would you be prepared to further on in the process, they said no, mediation has to have both parties involved, and it was quite clear the complainants were not prepared to do that. Okay, that's uh, helpful in, in clarifying that very well, thank you. Um, you said in your opening remarks um, that procedure um, is uh, shared with those likely to bring it, and that's common practice. Um, I would agree that sharing the procedure um, is common practice, but we're talking here about the draft procedure, and we've talked an awful lot uh, in various uh, proceedings that we've had in relation to uh, sharing draft procedure with the complainants in order to get lived experience. With hindsight, do you not think that it was a mistake to get input from someone who may well have been going on to make a complaint under the procedure, rather than asking input from stakeholder groups or other people that had been involved in previous complaints? Um, it was a mistake asking people who were going through the procedure, if you like, to get involved in drafting a procedure rather than, you know, I quite accept that everybody should be able to see the procedure, uh, a finalised procedure, if they're going to be making a complaint. So, to pick up a couple of points on, on that, Ms. Watt, I mean, first of all, we, we had, of course, spoken to those who um, had a, an interest in or a professional contribution to make about the procedure. We had drawn on guidance such as ACAS. We had spoken to Police Scotland. Or I hadn't, but those involved in drawing up the procedure had spoken to Police Scotland about how to get a most person-centred um, and appropriate um, procedure in place. So we had already done that. It was very late in the day. It was the near final draft that was shared with the complainants. And indeed, there were no further substantial changes made after that. So it wasn't that they were being consulted on that basis to change it. They were being they were being um, having the opportunity to have a look at it as a near final draft to illustrate them the kind of procedure that they would be engage, engaging with and that we would be operating should they decide to make complaints. We were completely transparent about this. I think you would have seen um, a note um, already that, that we weren't hiding it. It was part of a, of, of a normal business from our point of view. And it couldn't, um, I, I think the point was, could we have waited until the procedure was completely finalised? I think that's... Um, may well have caused problems in terms of, of timing. Hindsight is a wonderful thing. Uh, learning, I find, is better than hindsight. Um, I think that it was the right thing at the time. Um, I think I would be um, uh, thoughtful about every aspect that we have learned from the, from the procedure that we developed, but also that we implemented us, and I've been very open about that. But um, it was normal policy, it is normal policy, and it was intended to be helpful to the individuals to know what would likely unfold should they decide, uh, and some did and some didn't, to make their concerns or complaints. Okay, thanks. Um, and finally, convener, um, was the policy only shared with an extremely limited group because of the wish to finalise the procedure as quickly as possible? in order to respond adequately to the uh, re revelations of the Me Too movement? There was, uh, I'm not sure I quite understand the question, but, but the, the, the intention was to finalise the procedure as effectively, professionally and, and appropriately as we could. And by the time we shared the procedure, as I think you know, with 
the, those raising concerns at that stage. It was well on in its development process. It had been developed throughout most of, of November. So by the time it got to, to this point um, in early December, it was already well on its way to being finalized. And in fact, as I said, there were no, no real changes that after that um, uh, um, sharing with the, individual, the individuals who had concerns at that time. Okay, thank you. Uh, Andy Whiteman, please, to be followed by Stuart McMillan. Thank you very much, Convener, and welcome, uh, Permanent Secretary. I have a few areas to cover. Um, first of all, and apologies, I don't have the source of this information in my in my, my notes. I, I've omitted to to note it. But Mr. Salmond does claim in uh, evidence that's come to the committee that a particular allegation, I think it's allegation D for Delta, that had been made by one of the complainers had already been dealt with under the Fairness at Work policy while he was indeed First Minister. Um, can you just clarify, in the new procedure, there doesn't seem to be any stated provision for what would happen with a complaint coming forward under the new procedure that had already been dealt with under the previous procedure. So can you clarify what the policy is on that? And can you clarify whether, in fact, Allegation D was one that you rejected when you came to your decision report on the basis that it had been previously investigated and dealt with? So three things here. I think I should be take care about um, specifying uh, my decisions on particular um, allegations. More's the pity. I would be happy to provide more information and for me to share with you my decision report. But as I said, I'm afraid I'm unable to do that. However, um, I think the second and third point is we should differentiate between Mr. Salmon's uh, views on this and the procedure per se. In terms of where, what Mr. Salmon has said, the complainers came forward because they felt that there were still unresolved issues. And I don't think they would have come forward if they felt that Allegation D or any others of these individual concerns had been resolved at the time. And I think the other point is, and I made this point, I think, in the very beginning of my um, presentation of evidence to the committee back in August, when the complaints were raised, it would have been unconscionable for us not to have investigated them. Um, and I think the other point to be said is that I don't, I haven't seen any evidence that um, informal or fairness at work, informal resolution procedures were triggered at that point. And I think you've heard perhaps not um, you yourself as a relatively new member of the committee, but other members have heard evidence from um, Barbara Allison, Peter Housden, um, James Hind and others, none of whom um, were aware of any record of any resolution having taken place at the time that I think Mr. Salmon um, is claiming. I think the other point I would just finish with is informal resolution doesn't exclude the opportunity um, of an individual coming formal subsequently with a formal complaint. So although the, uh, somebody may think that it has been on either side, the, the person who's making the allegation or the person against whom it's being made, they think that has been resolved at the time or recall it as such, that doesn't stop an individual actually uh, being able to, under this procedure, take a formal complaint forward. And as part of that, you will understand that the um, Me Too movement really exposed very graphically in some instances how people felt uh, on reflection that whilst something had been addressed at the time, perhaps uh, somebody had said something or uh, apparently closed it off from their point of view at the time, looking back as part of the Me Too mo movement, it was quite clear that people were re-evaluating what that really meant for them, whether that really had given them any resolution or closure. And they were seeking to address how behaviour in the past actually was now beginning to come back to them in, in current times. So there is no reason why somebody who felt resolved informally couldn't make a complaint. And that, uh, I would intimate, is what happened on this occasion. At least that's what appears to have been the case. Okay, thank you. That's <clears throat> that's very very helpful. Um, can I move on to uh, batch two 
footnote 31, document INV 270. And this is a, a briefing in preparation uh, for a meeting between yourself and the complainers in the week commencing fifth of March 2018. Um, and this is about the briefing invites you to thank them for coming forward, clarifying your role, confirming that they're content with the way the investigation is being conducted, acknowledge how important it is to address the allegations, etc. You'll be, I think, familiar with this and presumably will recall the meeting. Um, what, just for clarification, what part of the procedure does that sit within your meeting the complainers in the week commencing 5th of March 2018? There's nothing in the procedure that prevents um, the deciding officer having contact with the complainers, um, and particularly not at that time in the investigation after I had taken a decision on the investigating officer's investigative report. But before then, that might have been um, more questionable, but I had taken a decision at that point. Um, in fact, it's standard good practice for uh, deciding officers to meet um, employees who have made a complaint to be able to explain the next stage of that procedure. So um, it was a very short uh, meeting. It was after I had taken a decision on whether there were causes for concern that should be investigated further, and I felt I was the appropriate person to tell them that in, in um, short term and to reassure them of the duty of care, which the government still, as their employer, still held for their interest and to ensure they had the right kind of information and support as the next stages of the procedure would unfold. And that's exactly what I did. So there is nothing in the procedure to, uh, to say that that shouldn't be done. And indeed, as I said, in good practice, uh, in HR terms, it's, it's frequently the case. I suppose the other point, just for information for you, is that I think I, I met with the complainants on three occasions. In fact, I have never met one of the complainants at all. I've only ever had um, uh, phone contact with the individual. And they were always short, um, important, but short meetings of a few minutes or discussions. But they were at very important times of the procedure. And the first of these was after I had taken the decision to um, uh, that there were concerns to um, to be investigated, and after I had uh, that first part of the procedure was complete. Okay, thank you. Just to confirm, you had three contacts with one of the complainers. The meeting in the week commencing fifth of March. Sorry, I think you want to confirm something. So yes, I mean, that may have been confusing. I had three contacts in the entirety of this procedure with the complainants. I um, only ever met one of them face to face. The other I had not met uh, in that context at all. It was always a phone conversation. And they were, uh, the first of these was in the week commencing, as you say, the 5th of March. It must have been around, I would think, the 6th, possibly the morning of the 7th of March. Um, but I had that conversation after the deciding um, decision report had been completed on that part of the investigation. And then subsequently, in August, after the complete process had been uh, complete and was being um, communicated more widely, and indeed I spoke to them very briefly at the time when we conceded the JR. Okay, thanks very much. That you've answered my my further question. Um, can I move on to uh, address the question of the appearance of? Um, a great amount of detail about the alleged incidents in the newspapers, specifically in the Daily Record, and I think also in the Sunday Post in August. I understand that the Information Commissioner Office has undertaken an investigation uh, into this, and indeed uh, we have seen um, some documentation from the Information Commissioner's Office in that regard. Um, at what point during this whole process did information relating to these complaints um, come into the possession of persons out with the Scottish Government? So I'm not, I'm not talking about the alleged leak to daily record at this stage, but at what point, for example, did the Lord Advocates Office or external counsel, at what point did they 
uh, were they in receipt of, of, of details of these allegations? So the detail of the allegations and and the the detail of the issues at stake and the evaluation of all of those were contained in in my decision report, the one I'm unable to share with you, but that had a very very limited circulation, as you might imagine. Um, there is quite particular um, detail about this in the procedure. So Mr. Salmon, through his lawyers, had a copy. Um, the complainants, Ms. A and Ms. B, had uh, copies, though suitably redacted, so that it related to them and, and not to, to others or other complaints. Um, the legal uh, legal lead and um, the director of people had a copy. Uh, and the director of people subsequently, as you know, shared a copy with the Crown Office. Um, that was that they were the only, it was a very tight, as, and quite quite rightly, a very tight copy list. Those were the only individuals that were able to have um, access to the decision report where that kind of information was contained. Okay, thanks very much. I think the Information Commissioner's uh, letter to Levy McCree of the 28th of May, which is our a request for a review of a decision by the criminal investigations team. Um, it outlines at paragraph 4.8 uh, 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 that um, the list of stakeholders who had access to the internal misconduct investigation report includes the original complainers, the QC, First Minister's Principal Private Secretary, the Crown Office and Procurator of Fiscal Service, and Mr. Salmon and Levy and McRae, as well as relevant staff members of the Scottish Government. So I think that that uh, aligns with the, the answer you've just given. Do you have, um, in the course of, did you ever undertake any investigations as to how this information came into the possession of uh, the Daily Record and the Sunday Post? Yes, uh, just to just to be uh, without being too pedantic about it, we need to differentiate, of course, between the investigating report and the decision-making report, which is the most comprehensive um, analysis and allocate and. Um, uh, uh, presentation of details here, but but yes, um, I recollect that we did undertake a uh, a review and an investigation, not just a review, but an investigation into the allegation of the leak. And and what what did you find? We found no evidence of any civil servant leaking that information. We found no evidence of a leak, and I think that is um, in the information that you have. Um, uh, that the committee has, but I'm happy to share that with you if, if not. Okay, so your 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 inquiries were related strictly re limited to establishing whether a leak came from a civil servant. I'd need to check the um, the remit of of the leak um, uh, of the the leak review, and I'm I'm very happy to. Um, Pass that information on to you. But when we and when we look at investigations of this kind, and they are uh, not frequent, but they are important when they are undertaken. They are comprehensive, and they look at um, electronic um, uh, sharing of the information. They look at the electronic imprint and footprint across the organisation. So that wouldn't uh, alone be about whether. That it was civil servants or not, it would also be about the mechanism that might be used to share information. So, if it is helpful, I will happily give you um, uh, an account of how those investigations are undertaken and the remit of that particular one, if that's useful. That, that would be helpful. Um, that's all I have for now, convener. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Wyman. I'm going to go to Stuart McMillan and then we will try Myrtle Fraser again. Stuart McMillan. Uh, thank you, convener. Good afternoon, uh, Permanent Secretary. Um, I, uh, you touched upon uh, Andy Whiteman being a relatively new member. Uh, obviously, I'm brand new to the committee today, and so maybe one or two of my questions uh, might uh, might already have been covered in previous sessions. But I am trying to get up to as much speed as I possibly can. But you, you touched upon the decision report, uh, indicating that it can't be shared. Can you please explain why? There is a, a fairly clear um, set of constraints and um, instructions contained within the procedure about who may receive the uh, decision report. And uh, so that's the first thing. The second thing is 
Um, I'm very mindful of the uh, confidentiality of the information and the decision report, so we would always be careful about sharing sensitive information of that kind. And thirdly, um, the decision report was reduced as part of the uh, court's ruling after the judicial review. And although the Scottish Government is of the, re of the view that we could still share some of that uh, with the committee, uh, Mr Salmon doesn't agree with that. Okay, okay, thank you. Um, uh, some, uh, both uh, Alex Cole Hamilton and Maureen Watt uh, asked some questions earlier, and uh, they also tied in with part of your opening statement, and that was regarding the, the development of the, the process. And uh, I think you, you stated earlier on that the new process designed, uh, and also you had uh, legal and HR advice um, throughout. Um, the, the process actually was fairly short. It started in early November, and it was signed off on the, the 20th of December. And in, in that period, uh, I know also there was some consultation uh, the draft report was sent to the uh, the council, uh, the Scottish government unions, the council of Scottish government unions uh, on the was it the fourteenth, and you had a meeting with them on the nineteenth. Um, so that that to me as a as somebody new to this committee and someone looking at this afresh, uh, that certainly seems to be a fairly first of all a short time frame to design what clearly is a, a, an extremely important process. Do, do you agree with that? Um, I'm not sure that I do. I mean, when we receive a cabinet commission, then clearly that takes priority. So we will not um, delay in uh, executing and pursuing that commission from cabinet. So that's the first thing. The second thing, we weren't starting from a, a complete starting point, as it were. We already had fairness at work procedure. Um, and we had, in fact, been in quite a lot of consultation and discussion with the unions about the um, adequacy or inadequacies um, of the fairness at work procedure at that time. So we weren't starting from a standing start. Um, we were aware of two elements, actually. One was, I think, um, the interest and support from the unions in having um, a, a procedure that uh, filled some of the gaps of the fairness at work, and I think they specifically said in their um, uh, evidence to this committee, which I know you will not have been party to, but when they were in front of the committee, that they were very comfortable with the timescale. They wanted us to, to, to pursue that. And I think the final point I would make in terms of the timescale is we were in the middle of the um, hashtag uh, me too campaign and there was a lot of um, activity and there were incidents already taking place we we knew i mean within holyrood but certainly within westminster where allegations were coming to the fore and concerns were being raised so it wasn't something that we wanted to um, take much time uh, too much time over but to do it thoroughly and final final point I was being exhorted by my own line manager, as were all permanent secretaries in the UK civil service, by Sir Jeremy Haywood as cabinet secretary. He wrote to all of us and asked us to be, be sufficiently speedy, um, as well as thorough, but to certainly look at um, what, making sure that we had effective processes in place to deal with any issues that might come up as a result of the um, uh, increased profile um, of the Me Too campaign. So, in short, not unusual for cabinet commissions to be carried out uh, speedily but effectively and responsibly. Uh, and there were a set of other circumstances, including support from unions, work that we'd already undertaken, and particularly exhortations from others um, to make sure that we had something in place that was going to be effective and appropriate in the circumstances that we were finding ourselves in. Okay, no, thank you for that. And uh, I mean, just uh, you also indicated earlier that you took you know, obviously legal and HR advice throughout the process. I would assume, obviously, that would have been internal. But did you take any external uh, HR and legal advice also as you were going through that process? So I wasn't developing the process, as, as again others around the table, the virtual table here will know. It wasn't it wasn't my role to do that. But I know that the uh, that James Hind um, 
Nicola Richard and, and others who you have, have heard from um, felt that it was appropriate to draw on other sources of expertise. That included um, documents and policy expertise um, from ACAS, but also, as I mentioned earlier on, I think, and I think she mentioned it in her own evidence, Judith McKinnon spoke to Police Scotland as well on at least one occasion in a generic form about how to ensure that the um, process and the procedure was as person-centred as possible and was um, helpful to individuals who might be coming forward who'd had, who were in distress um, and who were um, uncertain and uh, needed to be uh, reassured about the validity and the effectiveness of the procedure. Okay. Uh, thank you for that. And I've got a few other questions, <clears throat> excuse me, for me. And um, also, your role is the uh, deciding officer. Uh, can you just explain uh, exactly under the procedure uh, what that means and what it means for you? Yes, I think I shared with this um, uh, in response to an earlier question, but I'm very happy to to, to summarise. I think what I said then. Um, it's, it was really important for me to, to carry out three functions at this time, and I was, as I said earlier on, at more length, acutely aware of the responsibility of the, of the deciding officer. It was delegated to me only. Nobody else could do this, and that was in the procedure, so that wasn't going to be something, even if I wanted to do, that I could delegate or give to others. I needed to really approach this with a very open mind and to exercise the acute responsibility with great care. And in doing so, therefore, to really hold up to the light and interrogate the robustness and the quality, the appropriateness um, and the, the detail uh, of the evidence that was being presented to me and to look at the full text, um, which had not been filtered in any way, but the full text of witness statements that were presented to me on both sides. Secondly, I had to decide and look at each complaint and allegation individually. So this was not a blanket approach. I had to look at them one by one and assess one by one which of these complaints and allegations I was going to uphold and which I would not. And that's a really important point to emphasize. I had to decide on the basis of the witness information and other evidence, did this particular complaint and allegation merit being upheld or not? And then finally, the other areas that I was drawing on were the definitions of harassment as in equality legislation, which I have already mentioned, and particularly about whether atmospheres were being created of an intimidating, hostile, degrading or humiliating or offensive uh, environment. I needed to take into account the context of the, com the complaint, most importantly, the kind of working environment and the professional relationship between the individuals that were involved. I very much had to take into account and did so the impact of the individuals um, and uh, that was very important. I, I can still remember reading about these allegations personally, very clearly. I was um, really affected by them, really affected by them. And I also had to, on a counterbalance to that, ensure that I was satisfied that an event had occurred based on the evidence. So this was entirely evidence-led. And if so, if that had happened, was it in the manner that had been described by individuals and was it corroborated by other witness statements? So I had to ensure and ask myself, was there, as decision-making, was there enough evidence um, to inform a reasonable belief that a complaint was well-founded, drawing on each individual cause for concern, weighing up all the individual evidence available and advice and definitions in legislation, and setting out, therefore, my rationale for coming to that view, including which complaints I upheld and which complaints I did not upheld. And that was the process that I went through. And I would be happy to share more information on that but uh, unable to do so other than what I've, I've provided so far. Well, thank you for that. I mean, did they ever consider that as the person uh, who I believe actually put the procedure in place that perhaps that, that it should have been someone else who actually was the deciding officer? So I wasn't the person that designed the procedure. I wasn't the person that put the procedure in place. It was a government procedure that was designed by experts from, uh, from HR, 
uh, experts supported by legal advice and from other sources as we've just descri described. My role was described in the procedure to be the deciding officer and I undertook it on that basis. But it was a government procedure, one that had been approved by government like any other procedure um, and any other policy which has the head of the organisation involved in it in any way. I undertook my role as deciding officer completely in adherence to that procedure as described as a government procedure. Now, as I said earlier on, of course, we are asking um, look at the procedure with a forward-looking um, responsibility to see how we might implement it in the future. And she may have views on that and whether that needs to be, uh, the deciding officer needs to be uh, somehow different. But in terms of the government procedure as it exists at the moment, I took that role very seriously. And it was deciding uh, a deciding officer role that was not engaged in other aspects of the procedure. Whilst the investigating officer was gathering information, she was not the deciding factor. She was not responsible for decisions. I was not responsible or involved in gathering information, but I was the deciding officer. And it was important that we adhered to those two different roles and responsibilities. Um, certainly, as the deciding officer, was it your role to appoint the investigating officer? No. Okay. And does the procedure require that the permanent secretary is always the deciding officer? Or is there any scope at all under the procedure as it stands that someone else could actually play that particular role? No. And it certainly also appears that uh, that you were in, in regular contact with uh, Levy McRae, um, the, the former First Minister's lawyers, and about the process. And can you tell me uh, whether you were communicating with them as uh, part of your role as the deciding officer under the procedure, or in your more general role as the permanent secretary? So I became deciding officer once I had received the in investigative report, but I was very alert to that responsibility in the lead up throughout the whole of this, this time. So that was why I was not aware of quite large amounts of information, which I am now aware of actually as a result of the um, information trawls that have come to, to the committee. There, there was a very delineation to be held there. And as a result, um, people uh, who were responding to, on behalf of the Scottish Government, um, were quite often responding to Levy McRae, and I would not be involved or aware of what that kind of information was about. It was quite often quite technical, and quite often it was to do with the investigating process, so it was given to the investigating officer direct to take forward. So I was very acutely aware of the importance of the delineation of my roles and responsibilities of administering um, the process, but of being able to be able to step outside that at the appropriate time, uncontaminated by that, if you like, um, from, to be able to execute my role as deciding officer. That's not unusual, of course. There, there are frequent reasons and, and times and examples of where that differentiation of role and responsibility takes place. But I would say the other point, finally, on that is if, if you, as I'm sure you have, look at the um, the information and the exchanges between uh, Levy and McRae and the Scottish Government, a very large number of those are on technical aspects and they're, they're actually mostly about the procedure, uh, not about the implementation of the procedure and certainly not about issues that would be relevant to the deciding report. They're mostly um, about um, Mr Samrud expressing views about the procedure, not about the content of what might um, uh, eventually make its way into a deciding report. So it wasn't that difficult, I suppose the point I mean, it wasn't that difficult to differentiate in that respect. Okay. okay. Um, certainly uh, that's helpful. Do you, do you think that in the future that the deciding officer who clearly has to make impartial decisions about a complaint could also be responsible for communicating with the lawyers of one side of a complaint? Well, as I've said previously, we will be looking at the implementation of the procedure and Ms Dunlop is already, um, as we asked her to do, taking that on board. So we will take the recommendations of Ms Dunlop, of course, very, very seriously and be responding to those. 
I think the point that has to be made is that there is a there was a whole process of administration taking place as part of the communication with Libya McRae, which just carried on. It was not something that I was directly involved in. It was part of the administration and the day-to-day -day management of what was a significant undertaking. But there was a lot of other business going on, as there always is in government, that I was responsible for leading on, undertaking on, and being engaged in. So um, I could not and would not delegate the decision-making responsibilities. That was laid down in the procedure. And I was very acutely aware of the importance of my impartiality on that. And I've taken some time this morning to explain how I undertook that role with impartiality to the fore. The administration of the process was being dealt with by a, a team of people across a, a range of responsibilities and professional um, uh, expertise. So it, it actually was very clearly delineated between those two. But as I said earlier on, Ms. Dunlop may have views on the procedure and how we might follow it in the future. And I'm, of course, uh, very interested to hear and to respond to those in due course. Yeah, well, thank you. And finally, very briefly, uh, can you tell me who, other than yourself and the investigating officer, were involved in considering the complaint? It's probably been touched upon before, but just it's really just from my understanding. I think I think it depends what you mean by considering the complaint. In terms of the investigation and the decision making, the investigating officer was responsible and um, was given autonomy in terms of undertaking that investigation process, and that was her responsibility, her contact with witnesses, and so on and so forth. That was very much her domain. In terms of um, analysing the evidence that she had brought together and the information and facts that she had brought together and taking a decision as to whether up, to uphold or not to uphold those individual complaints and concerns. That was my responsibility, and I, I did not share that with other people. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, Kavina. Uh, thank you, Ms. McMillan. Now, we're going to try um, to see if we can hear from Myrtle Fraser again, and then we will go on to Jackie Bailey as a final a uh, question from the committee, Myrtle Fraser. Thank you, convener. I'm hoping you can now hear me better uh, than you could before. And uh, I'm kind of interested because he covered a number of the issues I was going to raise. So I just really have a, a fairly brief follow-up to Andy Whiteman's line of questioning on the issue of the media coverage of the complaints that appeared in the Daily Record and the Sunday Mail. Uh, and I can only imagine that that was very distressing for the complainants to see details uh, of the complaints being published in that manner. And it does seem that only someone with a detailed knowledge of the complaints could have provided uh, that information uh, to the to the media. And we might speculate that this was done to damage the first minister, with the former first minister rather, with no thought for the impact on the complainants. We were just being treated as collateral damage uh, in a political war that was going on in the background. So, can, can I ask you, um, Permanent Secretary, you, you told me you had conducted an inquiry into this. Did you interview individuals in the Scottish Government about this leak to the media? So, I said earlier on, um, and I can only agree with you, uh, if I may, about the impact on not just on the individuals, but on the, the on myself and others who had been very closely working on this um, whole episode. But also that we had taken every effort, made every effort to ensure that confidentiality and anonymity was preserved throughout what was quite a long period of time from the complaints originally being made in January to the decision report being complete in August. And there had been no leak and no sharing of information throughout the whole of that process, even though it was live, it was, um, it was complex, it was often very intense. There had been no leak during that time. And I was pleased to see that the Information Commissioner agreed um, in their findings that there was no evidence of the, the leak coming um, from the Scottish Government. 
The inquiry would not be held by me. I am not the person that undertakes these inquiries. It is actually part of the responsibility of the Director General, that role that I described earlier on, of the senior information risk owner to ensure that um, a investigation is undertaken. And um, it is a combination usually, although I've offered to share this process uh, and the information around it with the committee. But the usual process is it's a combination of an electronic and digital footprint analysis. So being able to track where a piece of paper, if I can call it that, but a piece of information is at any one time in the machinery of government, whether that's on somebody's email, whether it's been printed or not, whether it's been shared with others or not, and the status, the sensitivity of that information. Uh, but it also um, often does include, yes, interviews with individuals. Uh, as I said, I can't tell you on this account, I would not and do not hold these investigations personally, but I'm happy if I'm able to, and there are no constraints upon it to, to share information to, to be anonymized, but the procedure that we followed. Um, thank you very much, Permanent Secretary. That's a very helpful response. Would you be able to tell us either now or subsequently whether the First Minister's Chief of Staff, Liz Lloyd, was interviewed as part of that inquiry? I, as I said, I can't tell you now, and I don't know if we're going to be able to give individuals uh, details as part of what I can share, but I will share all I can on the inquiry um, on two counts. One, what is the procedure that we always follow? Because there is quite, as I mentioned earlier on, there is a formula to the investigations that are undertaken because they are both technical um, and digital as well as individual. So I'll happily give you that. And if I am able to put more flesh on the bones of this particular investigation, I, I will do. But as you know, I'm under constraints, as we all are, to do with identification of individuals and data protection. But I will share whatever I can. Thank, thank, thank you, Panasek, and thank you, Convener. I have no more questions. Thank you. Um, we'll move on to Jackie Bailey, please. Thank you very much, Convener, and um, good afternoon and welcome back to the Committee to the Permanent Secretary. Um, can I start with, with just a follow-up to Murdo Fraser's questioning, um, because I'm curious to know whether the names of the complainers would have been contained in either the investigating report or indeed in your decision-makers report. Um, and you know, further to that, um, could you tell us who therefore would know the actual names of the complainers um, and would it have been possible for a special advisor to know the name? And I'm quite content with short answers, given the time you've already been with us. So, no, is, is the answer to your first question. Ms. A and Ms. B was the titles that were given from the very beginning. Indeed, I did not know the identity of either until I had contact with them, which I've already described, in early March. So, um, there was no disclosure of names at any point. But could you therefore tell us um, you know, who in that very tight circle I think you're about to describe um, would know the names of the complainers? I'm assuming it's a handful of people. At the most, yes. Okay, could you possibly, if not now, certainly write to us, tell us who that was, and I'm specifically asking, would it have been possible for a special advisor um, to have known any of the complainants' names? I'll happily come back to you with um, who might have known, but you're absolutely right in your assertion that it was, as it should have been, a very small number of people who were alert. And as I said, I myself did not know quite rightly the identity of the individuals um, until I met and spoke with them in um, early March. So that gives you an indication of the care with which we were taking. In fact, I still don't know the identity of one of them, and I've never met them, and not sure that, um, that I ever will. So it was a very, very important part of the um, trust from the individuals and the competence of, of the procedure that we maintain very tight understanding of individuals, not just of complainants, if I might say, but also of witnesses too. If, if you could write to us specifically with the information of that tight circle and confirm in writing whether it would be possible for a special advisor 
to have known that information. I think that would be most helpful. Um, can I move on to um, looking at this whole question of a duty of candor? Um, because some of the documents um, released to us from the Davidson report suggest that on the 2nd of November, external counsel were required to stress the importance um, of the government's duty of candor, and that on November the 6th, 2018, in the court of session, Lord Pentland directed that he expected full candor and disclosure from the government. So, bearing that in mind, um, could you perhaps tell us why you have never previously revealed um, to us in all your appearances before this committee um, the information that not one, but both of your external counsel threatened to resign to walk off the case unless you conceded it by the 3rd of January 2019? So, I think you are asking why I did not, or why the Scottish Government did not share views and um, views expressed by Council as part of previous um, sharing of information. And I would point you to the uh, discussion and dialogue that has been taking place between the Scottish Government and Scottish Government Ministers and the Committee about how and when to share legally privileged information and indeed um, the, uh, the, the rules and responsibilities of uh, that govern law officers' roles as well. And this would fall into that category. But of course, the reading room has enabled a wider amount of information to be shared with the inquiry than had previously been um, uh, signed up to by the government. Um, we could argue whether that's sufficient, but, but I'm not going to waste time doing that. Um, we did, in fact, get hints of an answer from Paul Paquette when he appeared before the committee. Um, which clearly is now confirmed to us. So, so let me press you again. Um, you have a duty of candour. I think that's quite an overriding duty. Why did you not tell us this information in terms of that duty of candour? I think I've already said why this information has not been shared by the Scottish Government. I think the other point, which seems to be implicit in what you're saying, but tell me if I'm wrong, is. Um, I mentioned earlier on what the reasons were, what the rationale was for my taking a decision to concede the JR, to concede the judicial review, and the factors that I took into account. I won't rehearse them again because I think I went through them in quite a bit of detail. Um, but the main issues that I needed to take into account was legal advice, um, and I, I would have been um, irresponsible not to take account of the composite legal advice. And that was when I was. Uh, in the process of um, commissioning that information on the 21st of December. And that's an important date for me because it was the time at which I decided that I would need to take a decision about whether to proceed or not. And I've been very upfront, I think, at this session about what the factors were that I took into account in taking that decision. Let, let, let me go back then, because there are other important dates I would like to discuss with you. And in the, the same kind of terms of um, the duty of candor, let me turn to external counsel. Um, and it, when did they tell you that on balance you would be likely to lose? Was it in October? Um, was it at the consultation meeting that was held with council on November the 13th, which we know you personally attended? along with the First Minister and the Chief of Staff, or was it even earlier? And I'm not asking about composite legal advice, I'm asking specifically about external counsel. But I am talking about composite legal advice because that no, is what I'm, 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 I'm asking you about I external legal, legal counsel. That, that I, I can give, which is that I always took composite legal advice. Um, it would have been remiss for me to only have listened to one voice. At every stage, the legal advice that I was provided was complete and thorough and from a variety of sources, and that is quite right and quite appropriate. And indeed, at the time of, of uh, the time that I think you're, you're referring to, Ms. Bailey, at the end of, of October or the, around the middle of time of October, was a really important point because that composite legal advice was considering a new aspect, which was was it possible to interpret paragraph 10 differently? Was the interpretation that we had laid on it and that was within the spirit of, of its being drawn up somehow able to be interpreted differently? And that, prompted, that, wonder, a whole I, of, that prompted a 
oh, it's staff to work undertaken. That, that is not my question, and the Permanent Secretary understands that. My question is very specific. It's not about composite legal advice. It's about the advice from senior counsel, and I'm asking that did they say that, on balance, the Scottish Government would likely lose in October? Was that when they told you, or was it at the meeting on the 13th of November, attended by them, yourself, the First Minister, and the Chief of Staff? We had discussions with Council and with our legal advisers on the prospects of success throughout this period, as I have always said, and that included those dates. And I listened carefully to that advice, as did the First Minister. And those sources of advice were what guided us through and contained and continued to, to, continue to inform our decision that the case was statable until it was not, which is the point at which I was asking for advice from a variety of sources again on the 21st of December. Up until that stage, the advice that I was being provided with and from which I did not depart that composite advice was that the case was statable and that it was defensible and should be defended. And I think you heard that from the Lord Advocate himself on his evidence on the 17th of November. And I think you perfectly understand what I'm trying to pursue with you. It is not a question of the composite advice, which would include advice from Scottish Government lawyers. It is a question of what external senior counsel were telling you and I am asking again, based on just that advice, did they, in October, say to you that on balance you would be likely to lose? I cannot confirm legally privileged advice. I can say, um, as, as you know, Ms Bailey, I have constraints about what I can and can't say on that score, and that is still a subject of some uh, consideration between the committee and the Scottish Government ministers. What I can say is that I listened carefully to all legal advice from all sources at every stage, every single stage of the procedure, not just during the judicial review, but I had a really careful and really important role to and responsibilities to undertake, which means I was demanding me to take that legal advice. I cannot uphold the civil service code without listening to that legal advice. I cannot be, um, I, I could not be responsible in my role as principal accountable officer. And that included, of course, that included external counsel advice, but it also included advice from uh, Lord Advocate and from the uh, Scottish Government legal team. I thank you for that, but, but you haven't answered my question, and you know, that is unfortunate. So let me, let me move on and see if I can make progress elsewhere. Um, in terms of candor, the first revelation to Mr. Salmon's legal team of any issue with the investigating officer was, I believe, the 5th of November 2018. Yet you have made much, as I recall in your previous uh, appearances, um, that this issue wasn't in Mr. Salmon's pleadings to the court of session. Um, can I ask you, how could they have been if he wasn't aware of them, if your team didn't tell him about them? I think it's for Mr. Salmon to decide and to, to share with you the basis on which the grounds of the judicial review were drawn up by his team. As I think okay, we said earlier, I agree on the unlawful and unfairness of Excuse me, I'm, I'm going to interrupt here, uh, Ms. Bailey and Ms. Evans, because when you're both talking, it's particularly difficult when we're online to interrupt people. When you're both talking, you just turn into a big bubble of sound. Um, no. So. Whilst I, I can understand frustrations if it's felt that questions are not being answered, and I can understand frustrations if one feels that the questions aren't what they should be, I think the only way to deal with this sensibly is to listen to the question, then listen to the answer, and then have the disagreement if necessary, one by one. So, I can't remember who had started that exchange, um, but I think I'll go back to Miss Bailey, please. <laughs> Thank you very much, convener. Can I say that this serves to highlight, for me at least, how unsatisfactory having virtual sessions in. And you know, I see you nodding in agreement. I, I think this is something we will obviously discuss as a committee later. Um, I do apologise for interrupting, but but I am very keen to ask very fixed questions um, and get short responses to them. 
Okay, let, let, let me move on. Given um, that Ms McKinnon was perfectly open about her activities as the investigating officer, um, why didn't your civil servants tell the courts until the 5th of November, and indeed even your own counsel, um, until October 2018? Why so late? Why do they not tell them what? Sorry, I'm not sure about what they... Um, uh... About the activities of Ms McKinnon as the investigating officer that she'd met with complainants beforehand. Why was that never revealed? So it wasn't that it wasn't revealed, it was asked about at that point. That was at the time, at that time at the end of October and beginning of November, that became apparent um, from uh, the legal analysis that a different interpretation was possible. And at that point, it was requested that a number of civil servants provide information to illustrate the intention behind that role, which, as I've said before, has been um, talked about a lot around this table, about what was actually meant by the spirit of paragraph nine, um, of paragraph 10, and also what evidence could be brought to bear to show that. And that was when that commission was undertaken during quite a bit of November and actually still into the information gathering stage at the beginning of, of December. And as a result, pleadings were adjusted. We voluntarily yeah. provided that information to the other to, to to other council as you know. So who who asked about it and when? When did so, paragraph become open to interpretation? The legal uh, team was asking uh, Judith and others, I think James Hines, who, whose note you've seen at second of November, about the intent and about the information to illustrate the intent and the level of, of contact and and why that was part of the implementation of the procedure. That was from the beginning of November onwards and continued into the beginning of December. But your own council knew in October, did they not? I think it was the 29th of October that this was um, crystallised. I maybe need to check that, but it was around that time um, where additional advice and information was sought by the legal team to illustrate our interpretation of, para of that paragraph, how it had been applied. But the first disclosure was it not round about the 17th of October when Miss McKinnon was interviewed by junior counsel? I can't be exact by the time, but I know that it was under discussion at the end of October, absolutely, and there was a period of time throughout November, as I've said earlier, where uh, significant amounts of information and requests for further information to illustrate the nature of the role and the intent behind the role was being established. Okay, thank you. Um, can I move on? Some of the documents received showed us that you, and this has already been covered, but as the impartial decision maker, personally met both complainers in March 2018. Um, I understand before Mr. Salmond was informed about the procedure. Um, given your duty of candour and given the strictures of, of Lord Pentland, why was this meeting not disclosed? To who? To anybody, to the courts, to Mr. Salmond. I don't believe that it was particularly concealed, but the point about this was that it was part of the um, the pause point in the procedure to allow me to be able to really touch base with the individuals about duty of care. There was no discussion about content or anything else. It was after I had taken my decision. Um, it, that that was that was all that the meeting was about. Um, I can't I can't say uh, uh, finitely whether or not the Commission for Information included that in it or not. But there was no there was no attempt to conceal. But it would it would be something that would be naturally talked about. Um, it was part of the duty of care for the complainers. Okay, so it wasn't concealed, but neither was it disclosed. So that's unfortunate given the duty of candour that exists. Let, let me move us on. Um, you, you said that it's appropriate, and I don't want to misquote you, but, but it's good practice to actually work with the complainants. I understand that. But can you point to any clause in the procedure which says the decision maker is meant to meet the complainers? And the reason I'm asking you this is um, I think in your second appearance before the committee, I think you said to me it wouldn't be appropriate as the decision maker um, if you had contact with the complainants. Um, so if your policy was ruled unlawful, procedurally unfair, and tainted by apparent bias, 
because the investigating officer met the complainers before it started. Would that have happened on the discovery that you as the actual decision maker met them partly through? So I think uh, we could get into semantics, Ms Bailey, about what was actually ruled on the um, on the procedure, but it it was uh, about a, a, a ruling of apparent bias. Uh, many of the other earlier um, points that had been raised as part of earlier judicial review um, grounds were not discussed and were not ruled on. However, the point you're making is when I was previously at this committee, I was talking about the early stages and particularly about the development of the procedure and that I had not had contact with those who were raising concerns at that time. As soon as they had raised complaints, um, that would have put also um, a constraint on my contact with them quite rightly. However, as I said earlier on, the reason that I touched base with them at the time I did, which is the week of the 5th of March, I think it was probably a, a, a day, maybe some hours before uh, Mr. Salmond was made aware of the, uh, the, that point that I had reached in the investigation. The reason I met with them at that point was because I had taken a decision. It was not one that I was asking them about or they were involved in or that they could have influenced. I had taken a decision and that pause point in the procedure allowed me to touch base with them about my own duty of care and the organization's duty of care for them too. So it was quite appropriate and there was nothing in the procedure to say that that is, is not the case. I took my responsibilities for them and still do very seriously. Um, but I equally was bound by my responsibilities as a decision maker not to discuss that with them. And that pause point in the procedure at that point allowed me to do so, to talk to them without having been compromised on my decision making responsibilities. Okay. Um, the Lord Advocate has told us um, that the collapse of the case was more than just the wording of Clause 10, but the assumption of perceived bias in common law. Um, do you think a reasonable person might have a problem with a supposedly impartial decision maker meeting with just one side of a dispute and then not revealing this to the other? So I think if we're talking about um, the basis on which the concession was made, it was very clearly that it was um, the evidence that came forward at a very late stage in December which would have made it very difficult for us to rebut an inference of apparent rather than actual bias. So it was about apparent, not actual bias in the way that the investigating officer's role had been implemented. And we still stand by that. Clearly there is more to learn from it, but that was the basis on which this was being, um, uh, the, the concession on which I took a decision was made. I mean, it feels like we're dancing on the head of a pin here, but, but you know, I'll accept what you're saying to me. Let, let me move on, because I understand that a search warrant was served on the Scottish Government by the Crown Office, perhaps just over a year ago, um, to secure documentation in relation to the criminal case against Mr. Salmond. Um, I understand that that warrant specified recovery of all documents about any meetings between you as permanent secretary and the complainers. Therefore, were the documents about your meeting with the complainers furnished by the government in response to the search warrant or were they not? The search warrant was complied with. It included a copy of the decision report. Um, and if there are allegations or concerns about whether or not the Scottish Government complied with the warrant, I am not aware of them. If they are, then we would need to um, respond to them accordingly. But uh, when, when the warrant was served, which was in September 2019, to my understanding, it included some very specific requests for information, and we complied with those, and that included my decision report. Okay, let, let me take you back, because I asked you about the judicial review. I'm now asking you about the criminal case. And I'm saying to you that the warrant specified recovery of all documents about any meetings between you as permanent secretary and the complainers. Okay, it's very clear. So were the documents about your meeting with the complainers that we've just spoken about furnished by the government in response to the search warrant or were they not? 
I can't tell you that at this uh, stage. I could go back and ask the people who are responsible for complying with the warrant, um, but I can't tell you chapter and verse of which documents were provided. By, um, that, that would be very helpful if you could return to the committee. That, that would be very helpful if you could write to us answering that question. Um, it, can I just ask, because right at the very beginning, I recall you saying to us that um, you really didn't have that much to do with the policy, um, that it wasn't really your procedure at all. And today you've said it's the Scottish Government's procedure. Um, and I understand, understand that. But when I look at documentation um, from you, a letter of the 21st of June 2018 from yourself to Levy and McRae, you say, and I quote, the procedure was established by me, not the Scottish Government, but by you. Um, and when Angela Constance asked you on the 17th of November, um, she, she did, I think, describe your role as the common denominator of the whole saga. Um, you said it wasn't really your procedure at all. So, so when it, did it stop being your procedure? If it was the Scottish Government's procedure, at what meeting of Cabinet was this actually agreed? Was it decided on? It's certainly never been debated or disclosed to Parliament. So I'm kind of curious as to know when was the procedure discussed and approved by the Cabinet? It's an employment procedure. So an employment procedure, and I think I've said this earlier on, would not go to Parliament for approval. It was an employment procedure that emerged from a specific commission from the Cabinet, and it was signed off by the First Minister uh, at, I think, on, on or around the 20th of December. Now, I think we're also in danger of, of splitting hairs here. I, I, as a civil servant, as you know, constitutionally, civil servants don't exist. The procedure that I was responsible for ensuring was enacted and produced as a government procedure was in response to a cabinet commission. And it was and is a government procedure. I am therefore bound by it because, as you know, as a civil servant, I serve the government of the day and I serve the government's commissioned procedures and policies. So uh, whilst there may be, and indeed earlier on, I have made no secret of the fact that I'm responsible for what goes on in the organization and, um, and take that role and responsibility very seriously. I think there seems to be, uh, I hesitate to say it, but an attempt to try and personalize this in a way that is inappropriate and and not and not uh, not right. I am have never moved away or tried to do anything other than be quite clear about my responsibilities at the head of the organisation, and that is ensuring that we serve the government of the day and that we also implement government procedures. And that is what we did in this case. And I took my role in that and still do very seriously. And Vina, my final comment you'll be pleased to hear um, is I suspect that the Permanent Secretary may regret the sentence that she wrote in her letter to Levy and McRae, which says, and I quote, the procedure was established by me. It now looks as if it's the case, convener, um, that the failed procedure established by um, the Permanent Secretary is now an orphan um, with no one claiming ownership. Thank you, convener. That concludes my questions. I won't respond to that comment. Yeah. I think it's only fair for me to say here um, that uh, everyone is entitled to their view and to indeed state their view quite clearly and um, what they believe uh, to be the facts. Now, I'm very aware of time uh, moving on, but I do have a couple of further requests uh, which I will ask uh, members to be quick on. Um, so it's Margaret Mitchell and then Alex Cole Hamilton. Thank you, Convener. Permanent Secretary, I wonder if I could return you to uh, document FN43. That was numerous emails with the, about the complaint handling, and an email specifically uh, sent on the 3rd of August 2018. It's to Ms. B, and it's from someone whose name is redacted, but um, it's asking her to think about what you feel you need to know about the police and the event of incident being reported to them. And it says the question the permanent secretary is asking is, if the Scottish government reports to the police, will you cooperate? 
with the investigation. Now, I, I wondered why you asked that if your decision was taken um, to report this to the police on the basis of the, the criminality, despite the overwhelming view of the complainants definitely not wanting to go down that road and not being prepared to report the incidents themselves. So I, I think I mentioned earlier on that I was keen to try and allay or to address concerns or restrictions and constraints that the, the um, individuals might, or the complainants might come up with as, as a result of being um, very clearly against going to the police. Um, I think, uh, you know, as I said earlier on, I don't think I can add to it. I was very alert to their concerns and their um, a preference not to go to the police, um, but um, whether or not they would have uh, cooperated, and that's entirely at their hand, or, although not if the police require them to, um, I needed to take into account the issue of, of potential criminal responsibility. And I think trying to establish as best I could the, um, the, the intensity of, of their feelings their preparedness to engage, if I had, had to take that decision, was part of establishing and balancing those two competing demands. Okay. Um, you've made the distinction between the decision report and the final report of the investigating officer. I wonder if you could um, uh, comment, if this is the case, on the, appro the, the appropriateness of the, this report being offered to the police by the Crown Office. And can you explain your understanding of, apart from the final report from the investigating officer landing on your desk, um, where else you thought it would go and how did the Crown Office have it before the police had even carried out um, an investigation? Well, I think there's a little bit of confusion creeping in here, which maybe I could try and, um, and clarify. Uh, the difference is between the investigation report and the deciding report. So the investigation report was whether or not there were causes for concern um, or, or, or were, there, were there none and should an investigation and the decision report follow on from there. So those were two different reports. So just, just to be, I'm not being picky here, I'm just trying to be factually accurate on it to, to clarify your considerations. Um, I think the point about, I, I can't comment on, on the Crown Office about what their decision was uh, to take the report to the police or not. That would be for them to respond to. Um, what we did was, having taken the decision on the basis of legal advice, uh, that it should be referred uh, as potentially criminal, then uh, Ms Richards wrote to the Crown Office and included a copy of the decision report at that point. That was the only decision report that went out with a very small number, as I've said earlier on, of people um, seeing it uh, at that time in August 2018. But can I be clear, what was it that this officer, uh, the, the police were offered? Was it the investigating officer's final report or your decision report? No, the police weren't offered anything to my knowledge, but we shared the decision report, which was the final report with the Crown Office, and then they decided what to do with that there on in. Yeah, and it seems to me cart between, uh, before horse that they should then seek to give that to the police, who, after you made the complaint, is that correct? I believe um, uh, Ms. Richards no. said it was your decision. You didn't. Well, I just said. I would not make any complaints to the police. I took legal advice, having completed my decision report, and on the, on the level and potential of, of criminality. And following that advice, I, um, uh, and it was agreed that the, the Crown Office should be alerted. And Nicola Richards, as you know, wrote to the Crown Office and included a copy of the decision report at that point, and that was in August 2018. I understand you personally didn't make a complaint, but it was um, as a result of the procedure. And I'm asking about the appropriateness of this being provided to the Crown Office before the police had a chance to investigate. As I said, I took legal advice on the process and the decision and followed it. Right. Okay, one last question. Um, in the email I quoted um, from the 2nd of August, 
um, in an email to that person who I, I said name was redacted, Judith um, McKinnon says, I'm keen to ensure that you have everything you need, and this is to Ms. B, um, to help you come to a decision. So let me know if there's anything else um, I can do. And um, I'm in today, so if you want to meet, let me know. We know earlier that Gillian Russell gave evidence saying that she had a checklist that Judith McKinnon had provided, um, and that included. Um, um, was there any criminal content here? So, to the reasonable person, it seems to me then she was obviously totally involved in this and involved in the complaints and the criminal aspect of the complaints. So, can I ask, um, did you make any recommendation about the who should be um, providing uh, uh, investigating officer um, who actually did? Um, a pointer. I think it may have been Nicola Richards. Did you rec rec make a recommendation or any comment on that? And when the lawfulness of this process and the, the uh, previous involvement was being looked at, did it even occur to you for a nanosecond that there might be a risk? It could be interpreted a different way. And if it was, was that surely a risk not worth taking? Given your very senior position, um, and the duty you had to try and ensure the, the government act in the best possible way for all time. So I think we've touched on this quite quite comprehensively in, in this session and previous sessions. I did not appoint the investigating officer. That is not my role and not my responsibility as set out in the procedure. So Nicola Richards appointed the investigating officer in keeping with uh, paragraph 10 of, the, of that role and the qualities and qualifications, indeed, of Judith McKinnon in fitting that role. Um, I think I've reflected also on the interpretation of paragraph 10 and the, uh, the, the way in which the investigating officer conducted her professional duties quite in keeping with that. I'm not sure what the references to the police were in that respect. I wasn't involved in that process. As far as I'm aware, the, the police were not involved um, at all, except during the time when they were consulted on the policy at the very beginning of the development of the procedure, subsequently when the Crown Office were alerted to potential criminality as laid out in the decision report, and subsequently when they were investigating um, uh, Mr. Salmond and asked to speak to civil servants as, a, as part of that investigation. The avoidance of that, my last question wasn't really about the police. It was um, obvious that when they were talking about would the complainants be comfortable going to the police, would they cooperate with the police, Judith McKinnon again stepped in. And um, in that email exchange, it's clear you're asking a question, or whoever redacted is is saying you're asking a question. So you're very much aware of the involvement of Judith uh, McKinnon in this handling process. So when she was appointed, did you raise any concern? Did you think about it? Did you make any comment? And then when you were perfectly well aware it was an issue, again, if you wouldn't mind asking, uh, answering that question about the risk of it being interpreted another way, was that a risk worth taking? Perhaps in hindsight, you have a different answer. I think I have to go back to what I've said before. I wasn't involved in her um, appointment. Judith was carrying out her role as described and as evidenced in intent to this committee. Um, the role of the investigating officer having um, a duty of care and responsibility as well. Um, and subsequently, uh, and through the judicial review, the interpretation and different interpretation of that role and how it might be implemented in particular was was discussed, laid out. Was the point of, was one of the, the, the points of of concession, and that it could lead to apparent bias. So I think we're going over the same ground here, perhaps from different perspectives. Um, the intent on the uh, laying out of the role and responsibilities in the procedure was very clear, and Judith followed that intent. Um, looking back on it now, after the judicial review, it was clear that it was open to a different kind of interpretation. And so if we were implementing that um, uh, procedure now, it would not be on the same basis as we did then. I suppose, really, as a principal officer, with all your experience, it comes as a surprise that didn't occur to you or you didn't. Um, raise any objections then. But that's my last question. Thank you, convener.
Well, it was a statement, I think. <laughs> is, um, is that your um, section over, uh, Deputy Convener? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think Yes, that's me finished. Thank you, uh, Convener, and thank uh, Ms Evans for her responses. Thank you. Um, I'll go to Alex Cole Hamilton. If you could be brief, please, uh, Mr Cole Hamilton, that would be appreciated. Yes, thank you, um, uh, Convener. Thank you for bringing me back in. Um, uh, Permanent Secretary, um, I'm just keen to follow up on, actually, on Margaret's questioning about uh, the referral to the Crown Office. I, I think we've heard evidence from other civil servants to say there was a uh, the, the matter was passed to the police. Um, can you just confirm that the, it was passed to Crown and then the Crown passed it to the police? Is that how it happened? That's my understanding, yes. And I think Nicola Richard's letter, which has been kept, which has been shared with you, confirms that. Um, that may seem to be a false di differentiation, but as you will know, it, it's not. It's quite an important one. Okay, no, that's helpful. Um, secondly, um, just to, you, you, you told the committee quite helpfully that um, the identity of the complainers was not known to you until very, very late in the day. Um, did you know the identity of the complainers before the report was passed to the Crown Office? By the time that the report was, com yes, I had met with one of them in, in March. I, I have never met one of them, but I've spoken to them. Um, I think I had met them then by the time it was passed to the Crown Office once, if twice, because I met with them at the time that the decision report was complete. So that would be Thank the second occasion. And, um, but I must emphasize, just to be clear, that that was on the basis of a, of a, a need to have contact that I felt was appropriate given duty of care. Um, and even then, the, the conversations were kept short and to the point, appropriately so. Uh, the complainers have been very explicit that they did not want um, this their complaints to follow a criminal route, but um, obviously this report was then taken to uh, a criminal adjudicator in the Crown Office. Um, did you consider that that was removing the, the agency of those complainers, that um, going against their express wishes would actually perhaps in itself act as a barrier to future complainers coming forward and the, if they knew that their complaints would ultimately end up in the, police, the hands of the police, even if they'd said not? Well, I think I've given chapter and verse on this. This is not an easy decision to make at all. I was weighing up two competing and difficult, very, very important sets of circumstances. Um, and I didn't take the decision lightly. I took advice on it, considerable advice on it, and I didn't depart from that advice. But I was, as you know, from what I've said previously and from the conversations with, with, which were undertaken on my behalf in soliciting their views, I was very mindful, and to be honest, remain so, very mindful about the impact of them on them, their loss of privacy and their concerns and anxieties, and very empathetic. Nevertheless, as the procedure sets out, there may be occasions on which those have to be um, uh, weighed up against the potential of criminality and criminal um, proceedings. And whilst I wasn't making any prejudgments of that, I don't think I would have been um, acting appropriately or indeed um, in keeping with the civil service code not to have taken that tough decision on the basis of, of a referral to the Crown Office to decide whether there were criminal proceedings to be pursued or not. But that wasn't my decision. My decision was to send them to the right authorities to take that decision, and that's what I did. So given that flawed procedure is still in place, given that you acted against the wishes of complainers, the, the first two complainers to ever use this procedure, is it any surprise to you that there has not been a single complaint under that procedure in these past three years? Um, I'm not surprised that, that people think carefully about coming forward because I think they always will, um, despite the fact that I have done and others have done a huge amount to um, ensure a culture which is more open and which is more um, supportive of those kind of concerns. And I, I won't go through it again because we've, we've been here nearly three hours, but I mentioned earlier on the people survey result for 2020, which in fact is a, a new set of data than when I first gave evidence to this committee back in August, which, sh which shows that our inclusion and equalities uh, culture is it's the best it's ever been in terms of people feeling 
uh, more included, more at ease with the, the nature of the, of the organization. So I hope that the procedure being there and implemented appropriately would be a, a backstop, but I also hope that as much as possible, we are doing our best to prevent any kinds of circumstances where people feel that they may end up being sexually harassed at work. Thank you, Convener. No further questions for me. Okay, um, can, can I just say for the record here that I, I too have a memory of it being said in evidence about a police referral. It may just be a confusion between the respective roles of the Crown Office and the police and a collective term, but we'll certainly check that out uh, to make sure. That's correct. I think that has been, I think you're right that it was referred to. I, I would hesitate to use this term loosely. I mean, that's not the appropriate term for police, but it was the police, and I think you've got a, um, a communications to that effect. Yes, right. We will uh, make sure we have that right. Now, I am assured by Andy Whiteman that this last supplementary is uh, quick and very relevant. Andy Whiteman. Uh, thank you very much, Convener, and it follows on just from the point you've made. I just want to ask you, uh, Permanent Secretary, Section 19 of the procedure um, states that if at any point it becomes apparent that criminal behaviour might have occurred, the government may bring the matter directly to the attention of the police, uh, and it goes on again, uh, reference to the police. There is no reference in Para 19 of the procedure to referring anything to the Crown Office. You said earlier in evidence that you did that on the basis of legal advice. Can you say anything more about, therefore, why you referred it to the Crown Office and not, as paragraph 19 says, that you may refer it to the police? I can't say anything further than to say I was advised, I was given legal advice, and I didn't depart from that advice. Okay, thank you, Convener. Okay, uh, thank you, Ms. Evans. I've got tiny little things that, that I, I think I would like to have on record. First of all, we've heard and an awful lot of talk today about duty of care, and, uh, and that's as it should be. So, yes, the government does have a duty of care uh, to those who come forward with complaints of whatever nature. It also has a duty of care to its wider staff complement uh, to give confidence that they can come forward and discuss such matters. Do you feel, uh, Permanent Secretary, that that duty of care was met by the Scottish Government over these issues? So I think that there is a constant there is constant work to be done and constant initiatives. It's a, a constant gardening process, I would call it, to ensure that the culture of the organization is supportive and inclusive. And I think we know from Me Too and from some of the evidence that we've heard at this inquiry that that has not always been the case in the Scottish Government, or indeed, as Me Too it will confirm, any organisation. Um, I have taken very specific steps and innovations, both policy and in terms of the culture of the organisation, to ensure that our duty of care feels real to people, that they feel they can bring their whole selves to work, and that they are, they are concerned with how they're being treated or behaviour at work, they call it out and something will be done about it. I think the people survey results of this year are giving us encouraging signs that that's how people feel. Will it ever be complete? Will that work ever be over? Probably not. But it still needs to be importantly carried out, and I feel the organisation is in a different place now than it was a few years ago, but it is not by any means complete, and there is no room for complacency. Okay, thank you. And to refresh my memory, can you tell me when Laura Dunlop QC is likely to report? So I think that the Deputy First Minister is going to come back to you and give you some more specific date about that. Um, mm -hmm. She's asked a little bit longer, um, and we want to make sure that she is given every support in doing a thorough job. So I will confirm to you that we will be coming back to you with a, an expected date of completion. Okay, thank you very much. And can I thank you, Ms. E Evans? for your evidence today. It has been a long stretch. It's been longer than we anticipated, and I want to thank you uh, for giving us your time today with that. I also want to say generally that it's been particularly difficult at times um, having business effectively carried out when everyone is uh, remote. However, um, it is following parliamentary guidance. 
uh, about virtual committee meetings. And just to make it plain to everyone, it's not entirely in this committee's hands how we deal with our committee meetings, as we always must take into account what the Parliament's um, rules and regulations are and the effect it can have on very many people if we have gatherings, of course. So we will now have um, I think five to ten minutes break uh, of the committee uh, before we move into private session. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>